Hello, everyone. I think it's time to, time to start. Uh, welcome to our workshop, uh, NDSS workshop on uh, security and privacy uh, in standardized IoT. Uh, so uh, I'm, my name is Lu Yixing. I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University Bloomington. Also, uh, other, uh, my another co-chair is uh, uh, Professor Jim Camp, who is, who is standing at the back. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, so uh, in this workshop, um, so we have a, we in the past years we observed that the IoT design and implementation in the wild in deployed system are really heterogeneous. Different vendors in their design implementation are all look different. That had caused a fundamental problem for the user, for the consumer usability and the security and the privacy. So uh, we also observed that the many, uh, some industry unifying standard in IoT have emerged. For example, Meta protocol, uh, which is a application level protocol and the transport layer protocol. Also, the IoT also have seen uh, like a communication level protocol uh, as a standard. For, uh, that has been kind of standardized, like uh, MQTT, COAP, et cetera. So any security or sorry, any security or privacy problem in the standard can be easily inherited to real products, real system. Uh, so our goal of this workshop to like uh, uh, let's promote research into IoT standard security and uh, consider the foundational role of IoT design and implementation standards <coughs> to reshape to hopefully improve security, privacy, and the trustworthy of IoT system. So uh, we have, uh, besides uh, our co-chair, and we also have altogether uh, 18 uh, program committee members. Uh, so from, uh, uh, from the United States, from Europe, from Asia. Um, so uh, we received, uh, altogether we received 10 paper submission. Uh, we adopted a standard double blind review process and uh, most people that received three reviews. And, uh, and uh, there's some interesting statistics uh, regarding our submission. Uh, we, did, we, uh, we received the submission by authors from 13 international uh, institutes or universities. Uh, although, like, uh, most made from the United States, but we do also have authors and submission from, uh, uh, from Canada, from China, from Sweden, uh, from, uh, from India. Uh, uh, also in today's uh, program, we, have, uh, we are very fortunate to have two keynote speakers, uh, Michael Fagan from uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology, uh, who uh, Professor Jim Camp will introduce shortly. And we have another keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Gary McGraw uh, from uh, Berryville Institute of Machine Learning. And uh, just a quick, uh, quick brief of the program. So for after my opening remark, we will have the first keynote and followed by a, the first paper session. Uh, the first session mainly about just meta protocol and its standard, uh, of course, focusing on security and privacy. And then we will have a co uh, coffee break, and uh, then after coffee break, we will have the second keynote uh, by Dr. Gary McGraw uh, about uh, the talk is about uh, uh, large language model related to risk, uh, and also related to uh, policy on the policy side. And then we will announce a, uh, the Distinguished Paper Award, uh, followed by the last session of paper presentation. So next, I will hand over to Professor Jim Kemp, our co-chair. It's a pleasure and a privilege to uh, work with uh, my colleague, uh, Lu Yi, and to introduce uh, Dr. Fagan. If you have an IoT device in your house, they have already helped you. Uh, Lu Yi is one of the, the leaders in identifying C CVEs for IoT communications network. 
and Dr. Fagan has worked at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and uh, severely undersells his contributions in his modest bio in the program. The secure home routing, the uh, FCC issued a requirements yes, two days ago for IoT devices. The footnotes all say, you know, NIST IoT standard, NIST IoT standard. None of those would be what they are without Dr. Fagan and his willingness to bring his research and his doctoral skills to serve at the National Institute of Technology. So it is an honor and a privilege, and thank you so much for coming to this event to keynote. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gene. Uh, I would, I had a whole plan, a little, you know, thank you for bringing me out to sunny San Diego in February, but I think the weather in D.C. is actually nicer today than it is here. So now it just became a nice little joke. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm here to talk a bit today about some of the uh, insights I've gained from my work. Uh, as Gene mentioned, we've done a lot in the Cybersecurity for IoT program, not just myself, but our whole team, to develop a number of cybersecurity, um, we'll call them guidelines. What we do at NIST, in addition to the standardization work, we do what we call pre-standardization research, which sometimes develops into um, guidance documents. I'll go through a few, well, I'll mention a few of them today. Uh, and, and in all of that, as well as uh, going through and, and taking part in standards development, we've found uh, a lot of similar insights that uh, Lee presented in the beginning there, um, but also a lot that we can leverage that's already out there um, in the community. Quick disclaimer, just I'll have, there'll be pictures, a few things of products. These are just to demonstrate certain concepts. You'll, as I'll explain, uh, NIST hasn't, and our team hasn't looked at any of these things in particular, particularly the things that you'll see on the slides. Um, but I use them to demonstrate certain uh, cybersecurity considerations. A little bit about NIST uh, here in the United States. This is our mission to promote U.S. innovation, industrial competitiveness. Uh, we mainly do that by advancing measurement science, metrology, uh, as it's called. Uh, the development of standards, and then the overall promotion and understanding of technology, all in ways to enhance the economic security of the United States uh, and our competitiveness globally. We have two campuses. Uh, I primarily work uh, at near the Gaithersburg campus. We also have one in Boulder, which houses uh, a number of our labs. We, our work goes beyond cybersecurity, beyond IoT. We have a lot of efforts in uh, basic physics, um, metrology in the sense of the kilogram kind of metrology, uh, weights and measures and so forth, uh, systems and software as well. Um, I work in the information technology lab uh, where we aim to develop and cultivate trust in, in information technology. Um, with IoT being a hot topic for a number of years now, and I don't see it going away anytime soon, especially as it merges with some of these other ideas um, like future computing technologies and quantum, that's kind of what that's referring to, uh, and also kind of artificial intelligence. A quick note, like I mentioned, we don't develop, uh, you know, what we put out there isn't required by anyone to follow. It's not a standard in that way, even though I guess many standards are voluntary, but, um, you know, when a federal government person's up here, a lot of times people think regulatory. We're non-regulatory. Well, everything we do is voluntary, even the work that I'll be talking about today, um, unless it's specifically within, uh, in response to something on the FISMA Act there. So our SP 800 series is required for federal agencies to use. And then, um, as Gene mentioned, and as I'll point out in a few places, other agencies that are regulatory certainly can pick up NIST's work, and that's what's happening with the FCC, where that will be a voluntary program, but the application of NIST's work is required as part of the program, you know, uh, in that way. Um, normally, what we put out there is purely informational um, for folks similar to the research that is done and presented in places like this. So, I think everyone here understands what an IoT device is, but I know in the early days of our program, we wrangled with this one, and there was a lot of back and forth as to the value of even defining what IoT was. And so we call it a working definition. In the early days, we just called it a description of IoT, because um, there was a lot of uh, general pushback and kind of uh, it, what the implications of a specific NIST definition around IoT might mean. And, for our purposes, that wasn't so important. We needed a way to understand what was going to be different in this space um, uh, compared to the uh, cybersecurity of a laptop, say. 
Um, so where we landed and we got pretty broad agreement on to the point that it's been adopted into U.S. law uh, is an IoT device is, is a physical piece of equipment that has at least one transducer, could have many more, um, and at least one networking interface. Um, we, there's a bit more description in our work, uh, NIST IR 8259 in particular, um, about the uh, sort of uh, design of the product around the transducer. Because um, arguably, you know, the laptop in front of me or a smartphone in my pocket has a sensor and actuator as well. So you could, if you really argued, um, almost anything's IoT, but frankly, that's kind of the point of IoT, right? Internet of things, all things. Um, and at the early days, it was important to carve those out. These days, I think if you look at our work, uh, especially among, I think, experts like you all in this room, I, I don't think you'll see anything that we recommend be done for IoT cybersecurity. Um, being that foreign or unexpected as to what you'd see in a, in a laptop or a smartphone. So at the end of the day, even that connection, I think, is, is valid, um, but isn't quite where our work is best targeted, I guess I'd say. So that broad definition, though, touches on, you know, going outside of laptops and smartphones, a very wide array of applications, right? Smart locks, robots that are internet connected, uh, you know, home assistants, cameras, um, industrial equipment as well, and, and other commercial retail equipment, um, smart tractors, we saw those at CES, or at least I did when I was there. Drones are a popular category, of course, even down to connected dog collars. I mean, these are all the things you see the wide breadth of. Again, no news to anyone here. Um, but of course, cybersecurity in any of these places are gonna be different. Um, another key uh, that we, from the start, worked from is that humans interact with all these things in unexpected ways relative to, say, a laptop or a smartphone. Um, not, not necessarily unexpected from the user standpoint or from the designer standpoint, but unexpected from a cybersecurity standpoint. So um, maybe only two of the things on here, three if you went in the, into the cab of that tractor, have an interface. And on one of them, the interface is on another device, not on the drone itself, right? Um, like a, a GUI, like a, you know, you can talk to a bunch of these things, I guess. Um, but, but there's cybersecurity implications to those lack of or different interfaces just at the very surface level. The kind of interfa uh, net networking interfaces these devices use, it's not always Wi-Fi, um, could also carry its own cybersecurity implications. And then finally, what they do is different. You know, you could set up a laptop to do many of the things that are sitting here, right? You can make a laptop smart assistant, maybe not a lock unless you added something to it. Robot, maybe harder, but the camera for sure. You could use a laptop in a cab in a similar kind of way, right? Um, you could probably control a drone from a laptop, though the laptop can't become a drone. Um, but in a lot of these cases, uh, the, the use is so targeted that attacks are naturally going to, to focus on that human interaction and perhaps disrupting it or avoiding disrupting it when trying to do something nefarious like operate a botnet, which just means uh, uh, attacks could be either um, more intrusive <laughs> in that it's much more apparent when something's gone wrong that your device isn't working or on the other side of that spectrum, significantly less intrusive because the whole point is to be operating behind the scenes and using the flow that is naturally coming off these devices to hide illicit traffic. Um, and of course, there's implications in humans and all of that as well. Even a botnet, I mean, if, if uh, the devices stop working because the botnet's shut down and your device was infected, I mean, that can, that can impact you as well, but of course, um, the direct impacts related to one of these devices um, being attacked locally and targeting perhaps you in particular um, could be fairly high. And since our work is meant to think broadly, you know, that could be home consumers. A lot of those were consumer devices on the screen, but not all of them were. And even if it is a consumer device, the government may pick it up, right? I'll go back, just, you know, the smart locks could be used by the military and for, for foot lockers. Right? The, the common military bases are really common hubs for consumer IoT devices or consumer, what could become a consumer IoT device. You know, right now it might not be a, an IoT device, but you know, people live on military bases. People uh, live there 24 seven and for years. And so um, they may bring their own devices so the BYOD, very distinct from your usual government um, situation, but still somewhat similar. You know, people walk into government agencies wearing smartwatches that uh, might be connecting to the to the Wi-Fi, and and all of that's of concern for federal agencies um, and other large enterprises. So we uh, in those a lot of those devices I just showed, I mentioned they don't have an interface, right? So they're, they're probably going to have other what we call product components that support the device itself. Those are all devices, right? Uh, they're the physical piece of equipment that we would call the IOT equipment. Um, 
but a lot of times they have a remote backend. You know, that Smart Assistant probably does. A mobile application, similarly. Uh, one of them, um, you know, the, the drone that could be a phone attached or could just be a phone used to operate the drone. Um, so a lot of times these other components are critical to using the IoT device and, and can't be separated from it one way or the other. Um, if you don't ever connect your voice assistant to the internet, it, it can do some basic stuff, but it probably won't be able to understand what you're saying most of the time, or any of the time perhaps, um, with that being a core feature of a voice assistant, of course. Similarly, the drone, not going to get a lot of use out of it if you don't have some kind of controller, which even if it's a physical piece of equipment on its own is another component, maybe another IoT device, but um, the mobile app may also be the controller there, as the example I gave. Another common one we see is um, particularly in industrial spaces, especially networking hardware. Um, so proprietary sensor hubs uh, is a good example there, an RF sensor hub that digitizes the data perhaps depending on the, uh, the application. Um, and research sensor, net sensor networks is, is one we see there. It, it also occurs in the consumer market, but a little bit less so than the other two. So in our work when we were, um, first, when we first started in IoT, I mean, the inclusion of backends and mobile apps, it kind of got taken for granted over time. And the consideration of cybersecurity as it pertains to these other components related to IoT um, started to be neglected in the broader space. So our work as of late has really um, had a big push on IoT products. And I know to uh, an academic room like this, perhaps product seems a bit of a marketing word. We purposely use it to differentiate from an IoT device in that it includes all these other components such that if we are going to get very technical, I would call it a, a, a subsystem, a product system um, that you must, when you buy the, the device, that's what's actually what you're buying access to as well. Um, if not actually some amount of, uh, you know, I guess it's an EULA for the mobile app and things like that. Um, and you have access to the back end as all part of your use of the product. But um, if the back end is turned off, the product may no longer be actually functional to you anymore. Um, and all of that, I mean, our, our aim in that isn't taking down right to repair or anything like that. It's more of the cybersecurity implications of a constrained IoT device that relies on a back end to mitigate cybersecurity risks on the edge. Or the cybersecurity implications of a specialty gateway hardware being uh, a centralized location of data and obviously a natural target relative to the end devices in that case. The mobile app having control mechanisms and there being an API or some similar connection between the mobile app and the device. These all have significant cybersecurity considerations that can't be worked around that um, for most IoT devices, how I understand they're architected, are so tightly coupled, you couldn't really effectively mitigate cybersecurity risks by just focusing on an IoT device and what it does and how it protects its data. Um, quite naturally, it's, you know, if the pipe going to a certain point is all good, but then it's leaded from there, if you, you know, if your data is going through the leaded pipe, you could have leaded data, right? That's the you know, same kind of thing with the water. Just because some of the pipes are good doesn't mean the whole system's good. And truly a whole, you know, the system view of cybersecurity is quite critical. On top of that, and I won't spend too much long on this side, on this slide, because I want to get into our work and some of the implications for standards more specifically. Um, but once you open up and understand that uh, backends are involved here particularly um, for many IoT devices, and to some degree some of that, um, that networking hardware, uh, you, you then get a propensity for vendors um, to make use of that data. Uh, most times internal to the product, things like maintenance, giving you a heads up or, or even alerting them their own uh, engineering departments about parts failures or, or other issues like that outside of cybersecurity that is. Um, but of course, all of that, all of those applications, even as mundane as they may seem, have cybersecurity implications. You know, the bare minimum, the connection itself uh, but then that growing data set, how it's handled, there's also privacy implications there, of course. Um, and finally, there's that feedback loop, right? Everyone gets, you know, everyone, uh, folks in business get the idea that as these things get easier to do automatically, you can continue to push automation um, down your supply chain or down your, your architecture. So naturally, I think uh, I could, I mean, if it doesn't exist already, I will happily predict uh, with probably one-to-one -one odds that um, you know, big models and AI and machine learning is being used or will be used to decide how IoT devices will operate to some degree or another. And that'll be a selling point. That'll be what is, is sold to even industrial customers as a benefit of this smart city's sensor network or whatnot. Um, 
But of course, there's cybersecurity considerations there. One of the no most notable ones is the ability to apply digital forensics uh, concepts to artificial intelligence models, particularly neural networks and others that are uh, highly mathematical and, and less uh, human trained. Um, since the human readable forensics are not gonna be readily apparent. They'll be mathematical whys, right? A bunch of numbers and an equation, is, this is why the, the AI generated the response it did, which is not going to help an investigator in a federal agency or in law enforcement generally to determine if cybersecurity played a role in some incident, let alone um, the investigation of CVEs broadly and how, uh, if there could be even CVEs attributable to things like artificial intelligence. So uh, I mentioned 8259, that's one of the documents our team put out, uh, it's getting a bit in age now to the point that we may go back to it eventually and touch it up a little bit. Like I mentioned, back then we talked a lot about IoT devices. Um, a lot of the, well, I'd say all the concepts we talk about in 8259, you could easily interchange IoT device with IoT product and they all apply. Um, we do talk about the product concept there without defining it so clearly. Um, that's more of a product of our more recent work. That's why I mean, if we were, and we will, I, we actually have plans to go back rather soon um, to give this document a bit of a lift, um, update some of its references, things like that, because it's getting on about five years now. Uh, but this graphic is still valuable to demonstrate a point here about um, the overall connection that I want to make today, one of the main points, is that existing cybersecurity guidance is not being um, overshadowed or thrown in the dustbin of history by IoT. Quite the contrary. I think at NIST, we found over time that um, good cybersecurity practice is, is pretty much always technology agnostic. Um, how you apply the concepts are going to vary, um, but at the end of the day, all manufacturers of all digital products, laptops and smart devices in general uh, as well, could utilize um, cybersecurity laws, regulations, and regulatory guidance, as well as NIST guidance in cybersecurity um, traditionally, you know, the RMF, the Risk Management Framework, or the CSF, the Cybersecurity Framework, are useful for IoT, but um, it does take a, a, a nuanced understanding of how, which I'll get into now here today. So, for example, all these concepts, we, we mentioned this in one of our other documents, 8228. I mean, take out IoT, I mean, right, asset management. Organizations do that with their laptops and smartphones. Vulnerability management, access management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the examples on this screen aren't specific to IoT. That's why IoT is in parentheses on the, on the slide title there. These are approaches for cybersecurity and privacy generally across your, in, in, in a network, um, even in the home, right? I, I'd argue um, in my, with my own background in, in human factors that, you know, it's obviously, of course, doesn't look the same as an organization would do it. I don't use the RMF at home, but I know it's on my network. I use my router from time to time to make sure there's no IPs that are strange. I make sure me or my wife are updating our phones and things like that, right? So we're, I'm doing things like asset management. I'm doing vulnerability management. I'm making sure people who don't need my password don't get my password. I'm doing access management. It's to my own, you know, kind of a folk uh, application of risk management, but it certainly is rather similar if you, if you really drill down as to what happens in any organization. I think that piece of understanding opens up, um, or, or I guess, yeah, it, removes silos from thinking around cybersecurity that we've, we've worked with, or we've had to work around a lot. Because um, our work has hopped from sector to sector to sector. And at the end of the day, the kinds of approaches, uh, especially at this high level that we preach, end up being all the same. So there's a nuance to it though, right? That doesn't mean we're just, you know, our documents are a single page that say, go read the RMF. There's more to it. And that nuance is in the system element dynamic. Um, so I'll start at the smallest level, right? The IoT device, this is where it was easiest to explain. Um, from an enterprise standpoint, even from the home standpoint, let's keep it in the enterprise uh, to keep it simple. Um, if I wanna use an IoT device as NIST, uh, maybe we're buying a new piece of lab equipment that's gonna be internet connected. Um, it needs to meet something that NIST determines it needs to meet uh, related to cybersecurity to be able to be used in the agency. Sometimes that bar might be quite low because it's a research sandbox where it's the mitigations are on the network layer and so more, um, a more wild equipment can be attached without fear of there, or with less fear of there being a cybersecurity issue related to that. But um, maybe there needs to be a more direct connection and so 
Now you're talking about connecting it to the main network, which, like I highlighted earlier, um, uh, carries FISMA requirements. Federal agencies can't just willy-nilly connect whatever they want to the internet or even to their own networks. Um, all of it needs to be done securely. So you would apply the RMF generally or the CSF or both within the federal government to achieve that. So you determine which controls you'd apply to this system um, and then you'd apply those controls. Where IoT comes into play is you're Maybe with this lab equipment, that would be the case. But if you're now you're talking about just an internet-connected camera that's going to go in one laboratory, it's a small po purchase, you're certainly not going to realistically shift the security and privacy controls for the entire system for that one IoT device, or even for a lot of IoT devices. And in fact, that's what we anecdotal anecdotally heard, was agencies tried to adopt IoT and were told by their uh, infrastructure folks, no way, no how, we're never connecting that without an, even a, an attempt at, um, at working through some of the challenges that we certainly see, but aren't insurmountable. And that's where our guidance tried to come in with um, the element view, particularly for the federal government, <coughs> which takes this idea that an IoT device will be plugged into a network. And if you take the IoT product, it's a, a subsystem that will be connected to a larger system. And that subsystem or that element needs to support the controls to some reasonable degree that the customer wants to apply on that system. And that, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, is the crux of our work and really where it all flows from there. And this graphic from 8259 uh, really uh, draws that out. And I mean, this isn't very foreign either. It's kind of a, a central secure, secure development life cycle processes, right? And, um, but highlighting them in the IoT space proved to be quite beneficial uh, because IoT, ends up pushing on certain areas of secure development that um, may not get as much attention as, again, like remember to do vulnerability management, remember to plan for vulnerability management, which of course still applies to IoT. But this idea that who is using your, you know, who, okay, what's the expected user of a laptop? All people, right? Anyone above a certain age, essentially, but even below that right, in a lot of cases. So designing to that, particular user is nearly impossible. And, and so most laptops don't. And accessibility has lagged in computers for a long time due to that kind of thinking, right? Um, edge cases, uh, or I don't wanna call it edge cases, that's not the correct term for this. It's uh, you know unique populations that might have unique cybersecurity considerations um, may be quick, easily overlooked if you apply a really digital first mentality to cybersecurity for IoT. Um, and you don't take time to identify your expected users, which is, of course, part of a traditional secure development process. But you don't, you, you don't utilize that as much when you're making something that's intended to be used by everyone, so to speak. Um, a smart thermostat isn't intended to be used by everyone, not even in the home for most cases, right? Um, and most IoT devices, especially industrial IoT, get more and more into a select group of users where you can really effectively, as a manufacturer at least, and even as a customer, state or research your, your, your goals around cybersecurity, right? If I'm, a, if I'm a, an electrical utility, it's not exactly a mystery necessarily, the kinds of guidance I'd be referring to when I'm trying to secure my, my network. Um, and in fact, the kinds of issues I run into in doing that may be well documented in the news or otherwise. And, you, and we, pre, we preach in A259, utilizing all of that as part of your secure development process um, to be able to plan and to support customers, you know, their networks when they're plugged in, right? What they're going to do with it, how they're going to secure it. Now, that's not always possible. So, for example, if, you know, uh, customers expect to be able to set a password, but you don't use passwords. You're never going to be able to, you know, unless you downgrade your device and change fundamentally how it works, you're not going to be able to meet those needs and goals. And that's where the second part, what we call the post-market phase and this aspect of customer engagement comes into play, where it's really critical for manufacturers to communicate with customers what the cybersecurity expectations they've built into the device are and what that might mean for them as customers when uh, maybe they're, they don't, you know, it's not met for them. So this, again, the simplest is alerting the federal government that this device can't meet your cybersecurity requirements in one way or another. Um, but also, you know, for home customers as well, if it's something that's going to be unexpected, um, you know, uh, communicating that to customers and keeping them abreast of that kind of cybersecurity information is important. 
So to give manufacturers a starting point in that process, we've also developed a number of baselines and profiles over the years. So the core baseline, which is in NIST IR 8259 A and B respectively, are meant to be good cybersecurity that any device uh, or any product um, for any IoT uh, application um, you'd expect to be, uh, you'd expect to see, I mean. So again, uh, shouldn't be necessarily any concepts here um, that are foreign even to a laptop or a smartphone, but in IoT, hitting on all six of these technical requirements or baseline requirements and all four of these non-technical um, is, is at least where a lot of cybersecurity issues start for customers. So in support of asset management, things like having a device ID, uh, the ability to configure the device as part of vulnerability or broader cybersecurity management, data protection, you know, obviously if the device doesn't protect its data at rest or in storage, there's not a lot you can do other than mitigating that and, and how you interact with the device. Um, access control support, software update support, cybersecurity state awareness, I mentioned that one, sort of support for like digital forensics or even going beyond that, letting users know when something's gone wrong. I mean, that's well understood around say, uh, logins and, and authentication, you know, uh, hey, you've, you've logged in too many times and failed, so we're, you're gonna have to take a break for 10 minutes before we let you go again. I mean, that's basic cybersecurity state awareness because you're aware, as the machine's aware, there could be an attack coming and so they force a, a break in the amount of password tries. Um, but at a bare minimum, logging is something that's lacking, we've heard anecdotally in a lot of IoT devices. Um, but of course, the, these technical requirements um, may go unused or uh, not understood if, if not for good non-technical support. So documentation on the manufacturer side, um, for them to know that they've done all those steps on the last side properly is rather key. And then the other three, which are more um, outward facing or at least involve the customer, the ability to receive information from the customer, bug reports, questions in general. I mean, that's the first step to understanding if you have a vulnerability that you need to fix with a software patch. When you actually develop things like patches, telling customers about that. And then broadly, just education and awareness around cybersecurity related to the product um, is something we don't see discussed a whole lot. Um, it's usually, you know, if you look at an IoT device, it's much more what it can do for you as opposed to what it does for you in the sense of how it protects your data and all of that. Um, there's been a shift to that over time, um, but a lot of the push for education awareness that I think has been to the top, use of the trust mark and things like that, we preach it being kind of all the way top to bottom. Manufacturers should be leading the way there as well you know, kind of in their manuals or their digital support uh, documentation. Um, that's where you can take more opportunity, I'd say, um, as a manufacturer, to, to make customers aware of the good cybersecurity within these products. But even with all this and with all these interactions, um, this graphic's taken from SP 800-213, our federal government document, um, you still may not be able to, you know, actually use it. It may not meet your requirements at the end of the day. Um, and even in this, what we call determination four, um, I mean, this document was written only a couple of years ago. So unfortunately, and even since on it realistically, plenty of devices go used even if they don't meet your requirements. Um, and not so much, I mean, uh, I can't speak to anything I've heard of directly in the federal government, but that, that's the problem perhaps in many cases that lead to these real world, real world incidents involving IoT. And this being a bit of the call to action uh, for where uh, we see a lot of the standards movement in the policies landscape today. So unauthorized access to data, weak authentication, unauthorized access to devices leading to either data leakage or DDoS attacks, um, baby monitors and other vulnerable IoT products have been shown to have vulnerabilities allowing um, unauthorized users to get access to the devices or their data. Um, I mean, all I get, you know, it goes without saying this is concerning, of course, right? And as IoT is adopted further, you know, we unfortunately might only see more of this if cybersecurity isn't given more attention and, and privacy as well. Um, so fitness tracker data on military personnel was being publicly gathered up. Um, I guess that's a government related one that had happened a few years ago. Um, stories of access through IoT devices into the broader network, so your horizontal attacks, um, which is certainly a concern for large enterprises. And then of course, secondhand devices, I mean, um, I mean, it's phrased here as putting owners at risk, uh, putting previous owners at risk, um, but that's because of the lack of capability and lack of awareness around the cybersecurity of resale and all of that. So this isn't a natural thing. These are, the, these are the challenges and the impacts that come from lack of consideration of cybersecurity through the life cycle. These aren't inherent to IoT is my point. Um, I know a lot of fear mongering goes on around IoT and we certainly try to push back against that as well. Um, 
you know, obviously, you know, everything needs to be done with a head on your shoulders for a purpose. So connection with a purpose. Uh, but that there, there's not, not necessarily any inherent problem with using sensors and, and actuators to do interesting things and innovative things. Um, it's just when you put that functionality before security um, that not only do you undermine uh, people's cybersecurity and the networks themselves, but you undermine the adoption of IoT. If folks are more fearful and less trustworthy of IoT in general, um, that, that, that can put a dent in the amount that would otherwise be used. So in response to not necessarily any of those specific issues, but this growing discussion around the risks of the cybersecurity and privacy risks related to um, use of poorly designed, perhaps IoT devices, um, there's a growing US policy landscape, um, both at the national level. Um, we saw the Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020, uh, mostly focused on federal agencies, uh, calling upon NIST's work uh, to be used to secure IoT devices. But a part of that, again, is to motivate the adoption of IoT in federal agencies. Um, it's not just, oh, gee whiz, we have all these scary IoT devices. It's actually more of the opposite. It's IoT is not being adopted as much as we would like it to be um, as, as a nation, or at least as much as it could be, in, in benefiting citizens and taxpayers, uh, mainly because of the cybersecurity questions. And so our work and, and the Improvement Act is meant to um, hone in on that problem and, and help agencies adopt, cyber, uh, adopt secure IoT and use it securely in their networks. There have been a number of executive orders, um, one of the more notable ones, 14028, out of the executive branch related to IoT cybersecurity. I'll talk about uh, that one in just a minute a little bit more. And then there's been some state level movement as well around IoT cybersecurity, particularly here on the West Coast. Um, all of this is to just show that, um, you know, it's not just us in the, here in the room talking about this, as I'm sure you all know, it's, it's government policymakers as well. Though they're looking to us, NIST, and everyone here in the room, researchers, to answer a lot of these challenging questions, because I can tell you, Legislators on the Hill and even folks in the White House don't, certainly don't necessarily have the expertise um, to talk with the, the kind of depth that we can talk and, and the kind of depth that you all have in your papers that we'll be hearing from today. Um, so this is uh, this timeline sums it up a little bit more, a lot of the same stuff that I just showed there, so I'm just going to get to the next slide uh, to talk a little bit about Executive Order 14028, which connects up with the um, FCC's program that Jean mentioned um, when she was introducing me. So uh, the FCC is developing a cyber trust mark program that's uh, going to be a labeling program for cybersecurity of consumer IoT devices. It's still in development, but it does plan to launch this year. Um, it is the current status of the nation's response, the executive branch's response to Executive Order 14028, um, which NIST initially uh, worked towards in producing uh, what is now becoming uh, the, this idea of criteria label conformity and the overall process as to how you might develop one of these programs is being used by the FCC to roll out the cyber trust mark. Most notably, there are the criteria at the top because um, the other two are much more dependent on how the FCC decides to do things and are still open questions. So, and, and not that the criteria isn't either, but, but, but particularly on the label and how that might look or how conformity might be applied uh, in this program. Um, they're still, I, as far as I understand it, accepting comments and are still working on all that. So anyone in the room that has strong opinions on that, I definitely recommend uh, and encourage you to submit comment to the FCC. They need all the expertise they can get and they, they welcome it. Um, on the criteria, that's where NIST and our team focused a lot of our work in the uh, response to the executive order and what eventually produced NIST IR 8425, which is being used as the cybersecurity criteria for the program. But the U.S. program does not, uh, is not being developed in a vacuum either, and in fact, uh, some other programs uh, have a bit of a start on us, including the Singapore Cybersecurity Labeling Scheme, um, which operates you know, differently, of course, uh, on, on different criteria, and um, obviously since the FCC's program doesn't have a conformity mechanism identified or anything like that yet, um, it'll likely look and operate a bit different than Singapore. Um, but in Japan, in the EU, in Europe, uh, all across the world, we are seeing uh, a lot of interest from governments in cybersecurity of IoT and different approaches being taken across the world um, in this space. So here in the US, the FCC's program will be voluntary, uh, at least as the current status and as I understand it, meaning um, it's meant to be used by consumers as a way to differentiate good products and bad products if they care about cybersecurity. Um, the European work 
uh, such as the Cyber Resilience Act, is going to be mandatory. All devices sold in Europe will have to comply. Um, so of course that brings different approaches as well even to the criteria, but at the end of the day, we're still all approaching cybersecurity, I'd say, um, in a lot of the same ways. And so we're, we've been, and I say that because we've been working a lot to avoid, um, there's been a lot of worries on the industry side and the government side around um, fragmentation uh, as all these programs across the world develop with these different perspectives, these different approaches, um, that might splinter requirement sets uh, here, there, and other places, which, you know, uh, I think, frankly speaking, uh, there's going to be different approaches in different countries. Uh, there's cultural differences in different countries. There's, I mean, people, the citizens of those countries are different in how they expect to use the devices even. So naturally, there's going to be differences. Um, but there's certainly a good case to be made for uh, at least a unity of understanding as to how all the different programs link up. Uh, to allow for uh, ease of trade and, and ease of, of sale of the products across the globe um, while still increasing the bar for all consumers. So one way that that can happen is through standards, right? That's what standards are here for, especially voluntary consensus standards. There's been a lot of work over the years um, in, 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 I'll get to the ISO stuff after, because Etsy's 303645 is one notable standard in this area comes up a lot, it's used by the Singapore program. Uh, it's one that I'd say, we, I mean, we've been aware of it. It's a bit more specific in its provisions than our work in the sense that it, it comes out and says things like uh, no default passwords, which we don't dispute. Um, but our discussion of authentication, at least in its phrasing, is much broader. So like I mentioned, different approaches in different parts of the world. Um, but at the end of the day, no default password still links up with good authentication practices. Um, so there's still a connection there. Uh, the broader work at ISO, um, the, the ISO 27400 series documents that um, NIST has been working um, with other stakeholders, of course, um, in the ISO IEC space, uh, attempt to approach it in a broader way. Um, and and we, we hope that we'll have some success in doing that. Um, but, you know, Adoption of standards is voluntary, and so um, we'd like to see more adoption of some of these standards, but they're all new, and um, adoption is still to be seen to some degree. Um, that could, of course, change as the uh, trust mark takes off, mutual recognition across the world starts to gain even more traction and interest. Um, you could see more nations across other continents, across all continents, looking towards ISO and looking towards the international standard space as a way to avoid thorny discussions about how to approach cybersecurity and instead everyone can agree to do it the way it's already been agreed upon, right? Again, the function of voluntary standards, um, we're hoping that that adoption will take place. But frankly, there's still more that needs to be done and, and there, are other, uh, there are other efforts undergoing, right? The, the, this doesn't mean even those efforts or existing standards fill all the gaps. Certain aspects of IoT can be leveraged for additional uh, cybersecurity benefit, one good example of that's device intent signaling, um, where the heterogeneity of IoT can be used to, or you can monitor, you can use that as an, a more effective way to monitor. Whereas like the idea of a manufacturer's usage description for traditional IT equipment is more limited um, because most of them work the same or are more user uh, you know, focused in how they might look on a network, you know, how I use my laptop more tells you about what its network activity is going to look like. But IoT isn't quite like that, right? You know, there may be spikes and valleys based on how it's being used in the home, but um, certain aspects of the traffic are more, more predictable and thus more conducive to things like uh, um, a device intent signaling. Um, similarly, uh, solving challenges like onboarding many, many devices securely at once. You have ITF work in device onboarding. There's, uh, of course, interest in, in specific spaces like medical, um, automotive around IoT, and then as we'll hear today, there's been some private sector efforts like the Matter Standard um, and also CTA's 2119, which is um, related to the Cyber Trust Mark, um, as just more examples of, of the, the ferocious activity <laughs> around all sorts of big S and little s standards development that's going on around IoT. Um, some taking my you know, lessons that I brought up here today to heart more so than others, uh, frankly. So um, NIST is more involved in some of these than others, so of course that helps. Um, but some of them, of course, are so specific, they can't really touch on some of these broader implications, and if anything, are helping solve some of the gaps I've highlighted. 
but to tie it all together, and at the end of the day, where uh, we see standards and research broadly really applying um, is helping to bridge this middle layer. Um, our team, and this in a lot of cases when it comes to cybersecurity, is operating at this goals and principles layer of this graphic here, which is taken from our, uh, our consumer work, but ignore consumer, this applies to any sector truly, um, or could at least, again, even outside the context of a label. But you know, the work we put out are, are good outcomes for IoT devices, for IoT products. How they're met in any sector, in any space, we could continue to, you know, we've worked to make profiles where we've articulated what we, what we see as being the more specific for any, any sector and, and so forth, but we, that it's not always a testable document that we're producing, many times it's not. And that's where standards can come in to define what the requirements and attributes um, for a device or for a program that might be necessary to ensure that those outcomes are being met and that cybersecurity is therefore being supported. Um, and so, it, like I said, the research you all do, the hands-on with the physical products, with the protocols themselves, help inform the standards, they help inform the conformity assessment programs that are going to be built out um, to support all these outcomes across the globe. And, and, and so it's a, it's a big soup, it's a big melting pot um, at the moment, but uh, as that gumbo, as that stew um, continues to simmer, um, that's where standards development can come in as well and pick up the research that's been done, understand it, and build that into good practice. So with that, I open it to questions. Uh, we have our program website that you all can scan this QR code here for additional information on that and our list of publications with the other one there. Um, I, I believe we'll be able to distribute these slides, so um, if you can't grab this right now, you'll be able to look at that. And we always welcome feedback or thoughts at our our email address, irtsecurity at nist.gov. Thank you. All right, great, great. Yeah, nice talk. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we are open. We have uh, uh, more than 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, that was a great talk. Uh, so 10 years ago when the Internet of Things and the consumer side started to take off, I remember uh, we made a very sort of a community decision to separate it from existing uh, internets of this time, like aerospace and oil and gas. And there was a lot of pushback that this is going to make products too expensive mm -hmm. if you make things really as secure as mm -hmm. they need to be. Um, and so, you know, we have in some ways dumbed down our security for the consumer side. But now, as you said, they're mixing with all kinds of other things. You have consumer devices on military bases. Mm -hmm. How do you see that conversation moving forward now? Mm -hmm. Will we have to upgrade our notion of security for these devices now? Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion at NIST and externally uh, around some of our teams, because at NIST we make a bit of a distinction between um, industrial control systems and IoT. Um, so ICS being more, the, that's who the oil and gas would probably put themselves in. They'd say, we're an ICS, we're OT. OT is different than IoT. Um, and frankly, you know, I'm rather young, so my expertise only goes so back so far, but yeah, I can understand the difference in a world where there were digital components uh, that were either more embedded systems, more purpose-built to the specific sector um, or a specific application, were rather distinct from the consumer version or uh, consumer version of any digital product necessarily. So, you know, uh, Industrial tablets existed, right? And and the security of them were, of course, important. Um, but like you said, there was generally this separation of the understanding of a consumer tablet versus those because that tablet uses X Y Z different protocols, and and you know the people using it are trained and so on and so forth. What we're seeing, I guess, is is more and more, uh, and not 100% to these days, unfortunately, still, but. Uh, folks in the OT community and IoT community coming together in realization that. Um, as the networking capabilities increase, those distinctions become more and more meaningless, right? And it's, and as the computing power that goes into industrial, I mean, many times it's already been high, but as it stays high or gets higher, uh, in the case of embedded systems or sensor networks and things like that, um, the distinction between, or the, the cost concerns should start to go away because the costs related to the risks start to go up a lot higher. It, what I'm getting at is previously, I think that was somewhat justified based on a risk assessment. You could say the internet connectivity is lower, the botnet capabilities are lower, the training of the, the access by the individuals is all controlled in different ways. But um, 
as there's either easy ability to, um, you know, even by employees themselves backdoor into the network so they can remote in to do things from home or where that's just part of how the product works, you can't lean on that anymore as part of your risk assessment. You know, the, the vulnerabilities, the likelihood of impact is going up. And, and I think we see that, that like I said, um, there's been growing uh, acknowledgement of that in the OT space. And I think uh, more so uh, they haven't been as, um, no, 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 when we try to talk to them, like you're saying. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a much more welcoming um, approach to cybersecurity. And I think part of that's the, the fact that there are more standards for IoT cybersecurity as well. I think that they're a, my own personal, uh, like kind of my, my take is that those spaces are more reliant on standards to get their, their engineering job done in the physical space, the physical realm in a lot of cases. And so for cybersecurity, the lack of direct standards um, sometimes hurt the app. The, the, yeah. the I, I think it will be an enabler for function for exactly. many of these. So industry will be kind of dragged into the future. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. So so yeah, I think that it's it's getting better. All right. Great. <coughs> Other question? I think uh, right next to you. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, private data is the uh, like very foundation of uh, the assessment of uh, IoT or IoT security and privacy. And but the private data in the IoT context could be like very complicated mm -hmm. and uh, like domain specific. Even mm -hmm. for the uh, PII, like uh, this um, in PII uh, could have a lot of instance mm -hmm. uh, consider different IoT usage scenario or IoT device. So. Uh, what's your ambition uh, for the potential standardizing effort to put on, like, have a definition for this private data? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I think we found so my the at NIST the privacy work at NIST is generally done through the privacy engineering program, which we work very closely with, but they're separate from us. So I can only speak to some degree related to privacy, but. Uh, that idea that there exists a gray area essentially for, for IoT data and how you might designate it private, right? It's not necessarily PII, but it's certainly sensitive, particularly within the use case. Um, that's one of the main challenge, or not, I don't want to say that. It's definitely a challenge around privacy and how you'd apply, uh, you know, again, you can apply traditional privacy engineering principles to IoT, but that's one of the considerations that's certainly going to be different, you know. Uh, one example we like to give there for, um, you know, might not, it's not so much privacy because it involves an organization, but it, it touches on privacy of these devices, is the ability, say, to tell if a certain government agency building is occupied at certain hours because of the whatever data is being thrown off of IoT devices. Again, wasn't anyone's PII, wasn't even determined by the agency to be sensitive data, but is then used in an attack. Um, how you would even formalize that into a broader understanding is certainly lacking right now, and I think there's that's a good area for standards. Um, I don't know of any that's going in that direction right now, but um, that would be something that I, I agree would be a real good benefit to IoT because there are a lot of questions about, um, you know, I think it's easy to point to say the command control data, you know, not in the attack sense, right, with a DDoS attack, but with uh, how the IoT device network is operating. That's certainly sensitive, right? Like sort of operational data, the the, you know, if you send um, from your mobile app to your thermostat a command to raise the temperature, um, that data, I mean, at, at, on its own should be treated as, you know, some kind of sensitivity level to the system because um, something, some actuator is reacting based on that. Um, and then the, the fact that you can, you can learn things about the environment on, on even just the sensing end, um, you know, I think everyone can acknowledge the risks, but there, there's not a good standardized uh, taxonomy to, to, to approaching all of that. So, um, and, and our team doesn't have good answers there either at this point. But uh, so, so that's area where research and standards can certainly help as well. And I, and I do think that would be of great benefit. All right, great. Uh, other question? Yeah, I think I have a question. Yep. You mentioned the, the, the difference between standards, which is like a volunta voluntary compared to regulation and laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering what are the communication channel of dialogue between NIFT and the industry and mm -hmm. between industry and uh, regulators? Sure. 
so between this and industry, they, uh, we have a community that we've fostered now over a few years. So we, we get in public comment. We put all of our work out for public comment, multiple rounds of it these days with the taking advantage of the digital space. Um, so we work very closely with industry um, in that way, very publicly, but closely as well. Um, then FCC and other regulators work uh, less closely with industry by their charters and by how all that works. I don't work for any of those agencies, but um, it's a much more formal process. So we can have meetings with anyone here and there. It's just part of our how we do business. FCC, you know, a meeting has to be publicly posted. Folks have to be made aware. Um, so that way, if you wanted to attend it as an interested party, you could. Um, so industry has a much more um, paper relationship with FCC, unless they're being investigated, and then it's probably much more direct. But in general, in my experience, uh, industry uh, communicates with FCC via the public comment process. So you can actually read the whole conversation, essentially, you know, between what FCC puts back out and everything that goes in. It's all made public. So every comment made by, by, uh, by some sort of industry individual will be, will be preserved by the FCC. Uh, we preserve it as well, but we don't always make it public just for comparison. You know, um, everything we do is, can be made public by the you know, Freedom of Information Act, but we're not under obligation to make it public as part of our, our process of what we do. Um, so that lets people speak more frankly with us in a lot of ways too. So it's helpful. More question okay. before I ask the next question. So you, you also mentioned uh, this year regarding the cybersecurity label to, mm -hmm. to IoT. You mentioned that this year something it will be relieved, or if the standard will be relieved, or some kind of regulation will be relieved, or product to support the program. Oh, you mean to support the program? Would there be something released? Oh yeah. So well, uh, the pro FCC is developing the program. I think they're. They're hoping to base it as much as they can on standards. Um, there's a lot of activity right now in the space. I'm not aware of everything, of course, because uh, some of it can be in the private sector. But I, I did mention CTA 2119. CTA technically is a standards development organization, is the Consumer Technology Association. Um, so I think they're ANSI accredited, so they're a North American standards body. So 2119 is technically a standard. Um, we're involved in its development as a participant, uh, but so are a, num a number of companies who are CTA members. Um, so that's one standard that they're hoping to pitch as one that can guide the FCC in how they would uh, um, apply the NIST criteria and, and operate the program broadly. So, um, so that's one standard there. Otherwise, I think the FCC plans um, to lay out the rules, gather feedback on them, finalize the rules, and then the program will run based on those rules. Great, great. I think maybe to better utilize the time, if you any more questions. Or maybe I can ask the last question to conclude. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think maybe some of the researchers here may be interested in any collaboration opportunity with mm -hmm. NIST. Yeah, of course. So NIST, yeah, we, our team, I mean, we, there's a lot of folks, you can always reach out to me and our team here. Um, I'll have my card so you can grab me during the coffee break. I'm happy to share my card and all. I can put you in touch depending on what your specific research is because we're not the only ones doing IoT work. There's some folks in the communications technology lab um, that, that does some stuff on IoT related to cybersecurity and more broadly. Um, and then if you're really drilling down to specific protocols or specific approaches or specific considerations, there may be a team that doing that in that specific capacity. So AI, for example, um, embedded systems, all that kind of stuff. So uh, NIST always welcomes uh, the researcher community to join our, our stakeholder communities. You know, we have some researchers in ours. We always welcome more. Um, it's, it's helpful to get that different outside perspective when a lot of times, you know, we're the Department of Commerce. People are paid to interact with us in these industries. So we always get comments from the big players in the space. Um, it's, it's more rare that we get comments from researchers. So those are extra valuable in that way in giving us a different perspective. And, and also part of the reason why I was more than happy that Gene um, invited me to this here today, um, to present our work to different audiences like this um, is always definitely um, extra valuable in the sense that the perspective you all bring um, is going to be different, um, sometimes purposefully different <laughs> than what, not from your end, but perhaps from the industry side, from what we hear from industry. And at the end of the day, um, you know, even if you and I may agree, uh, you know, and you may know I agree with you, I can't necessarily do much, right? Like I can write the work, I can do this, I can do that. 
But if, if, if five major corporations sent us in comment that says they don't like something um, and, and they recommend we, we reapproach it, um, you know, we have to take that seriously. Um, but if we have five comments from researchers that say, no, you're doing it the right way or, or you know, we support this work, that's always helpful to be able to uh, have that counterbalance in our comment set. So that way we can um, convince our own management that we're going the right way on things because unfortunately sometimes uh, they're not always bought in. And then, um, like I mentioned, if things were ever to be made public due to an Information Act request, it's always helpful you know, from our end that our decisions were made based on public record. Um, and not just informal conversations at conferences. So, so yeah, we, uh, I welcome, yeah, it's a good question because we are always looking to have more our community grow. So if you're interested in, in commenting on our work or learning more about our work, please uh, approach me. I'm happy to share my card and we can talk more in the near future. All right, great. Thank you so much. Let's thank you. Welcome. Yeah, let's, th thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, for, uh, immediately, immediately following this, we have three paper presentation. Uh, before the coffee break. Um, so yeah, let's uh, maybe take one minute to re relaxing time and let the presenter to hook up uh, with the facilities. So uh, the the first paper in this uh, session is uh, presented by Jing Yu Qian, who is a final year PhD student at uh, Univers University of Illinois. Uh, his advisor is uh, Professor uh, Carl Gunter. Uh, let's welcome the speaker. All right, so let's get started. So today I'd like to present my work on designing and evaluating a test bed for the Meta Protocol, insights into user experience. So uh, Meta Protocol is now an emerging standard designed to address interoperability in consumer IoT. Uh, it's not being accepted by a lot of major uh, smart home device manufacturers these days. Uh, there are a lot of potential research opportunities to study the capabilities and shortcomings of this Meta Protocol. Uh, there are some previous work on building a uh, matter test bed, but they lack a variety of matter devices and uh, does not quite closely re uh, replicate a consumer setting. So we are trying to build a test bed to overcome this issue. So our test bed is specifically designed to evaluate the matter protocol in a smart home environment. Um, the test bed incorporates additional functionality such as capturing network traffic through all stages of the smart home device lifecycle. And we hope the building of this uh, meta test bed can promote future matter related research. And we will show an example project using our test bed by a group of novice graduate students working on meta research. Um, our test bed is composed of uh, three parts a home assistant server, uh, meta devices, and the hub system. The home assistant server is a desktop computer equipped with home assistant uh, supervised version. Home Assistant is an open source um, home automation platform that supports multiple smart home devices from different manufacturers. Uh, it also allows users to control devices from a single interface. Uh, currently, we use this Home Assistant server as a way to, uh, to, to perform as a like, meta controller using specific meta add-ons. Uh, we also have this uh, Home Assistant Sky Connect dongle, which operates as the open uh, thread border router, which support, uh, which allows us to introduce uh, thread-enabled devices into the test bed. Uh, in the uh, Home Assistant server, we also run the Python Matter server add-on uh, to log matter nodes information, such as attributes from each clusters. Um, currently, we use uh, five off-the-shelf matter certified devices into the test bed, including a uh, motion sensor, uh, two-door sensors, a smart bulb, and a smart plug. Uh, they operate via Wi-Fi or thread, which covers the main uh, communication protocols uh, used in a typical matter network. 
So the, the hub system uh, is envisioned uh, as a futuristic but unified interface to monitor and uh, control smart devices in the testbed. Uh, we currently use a Raspberry Pi running host IBD as the main Wi-Fi access point, and we distribute uh, satellite components around the lab or home to complement the main hub unit. Uh, this allows us to extend the coverage of network traffic analysis and capturing. Uh, we use two Nordic semiconductor dongles to capture thread and BLE traffic uh, in the testbed. And we also use a TP-Link Archer dongle to capture Wi-Fi traffic. So this hub system also houses the routines to collect and parse network data and uh, build a database to store all the corresponding network information. And in particular, we have data include, including uh, device information, IP and MAC address for each devices, uh, commands issued to the devices and uh, some detailed network communication information, such as detailed parties, uh, including certain uh, interactions between different matter devices. <coughs> now I will kind of briefly introduce uh, like an uh, example student project which uses our testbed. And we'd like to use this as an example to illustrate the usability of the testbed and how this could promote some potential research. Uh, this is a course project on smart home security and privacy by four graduate students in a course. And they were introduced to Meta Protocol uh, and some high level uh, project ideas and directions before they uh, conducted their own uh, research or project. Uh, they were also introduced how to use our testbed such as through um, remote access because our testbed is hosted in a different university from, uh, from their university. Uh, we, they were also told in detail some testbed capabilities like their network capturing capabilities, et cetera. And they were also taught how to build the home assistant uh, add-ons and apply them in the current testbed to support different matter functionalities. So using the testbed, the student built a role-based access control uh, uh, systems, which enforced access control over device attributes depending on different roles. Uh, currently, they have three roles, the admin uh, handy tag or user. Uh, ha uh, admin plays an administrator role, which handles uh, access control uh, management. Uh, HandyTag can be viewed as a tech support uh, that we envision as a person who can come to your home to um, check the diagnostics logs of different devices and figure out uh, any uh, malfunction devices and fix them. Uh, user role is a basic daily user of a specific smart home devices which uh, should have basic, uh, uh, basic access to information like how certain application or smart devices work. Um, and so as I've mentioned, the admin can determine which user can access attributes from uh, which nodes. They can grant uh, or revoke access uh, of another rows uh, to, to a specific node. And they can also add or remove new users uh, in, in the system. Uh, depending on different rows, uh, people can have access to attributes from uh, different sets of clusters. For instance, uh, in the table, you can see that the handy tag who should check certain diagnostic information is typically allow access to attributes in, uh, defining uh, diagnostic related clusters here. And all the system is built upon, uh, through a home assistant add-on, uh, and it uses a specific MongoDB to store snapshots of device attributes um, structured by node, uh, endpoint, and cluster. So it's basic uh, as, as a matter of data model. So um, throughout the students' experience, we asked them to reveal any impediments during their experience of conducting this research. And uh, we also asked them to provide a specific section in their course presentation to introduce any issues they encounter uh, during their um, process. So overall, uh, they told us that the testbed is easy to set up and use, except for the following impediments. So first, the building time for this home assistant add-ons they, that they, they build this access control system in which runs as a Docker container, but the building time can, be, uh, can take a long, long time. And we suspect it's not a basic issue with the testbed, it's more likely the issue because of the complexity in the dependency of the matter add-on. Um, second, we have uh, issues related to uh, the remote access. So, pro uh, so currently, uh, they access the testbed through remote access, but to enable certain functionalities, this requires us to have a colleagues physically uh, configure some, uh, something like port configuration on the testbed side. So home assistant add-on container requires configuration of shared port on the desktop machine. So we need to have our colleague to physically be there to configure, configure the port. 
Uh, finally, system can sometimes become unstable because of uh, incompatible software version of the Home Assistant Core and Home Assistant Matter add-on, and we sometimes need to make sure that the version of the Home Assistant Core is up to date, and in some rare cases, we need to downgrade that to keep it more compatible. So we hope that this won't be a bigger issue in the future stage of the matter because it's still evolving and we think the issue probably will abate in the future. But at the current stage, we still need to make sure everything is compatible to make sure the home assistant server is always reachable. Uh, some future directions, uh, we are thinking about like uh, adding additional matter certified devices into the testbed and we have capability to do that. Uh, we are thinking about exploring uh, more capabilities of the hub system besides network capturing, such as doing smart um, intrusion detection based on the analysis of the traffic. Uh, we are already uh, trying to add uh, extra hub to support the future study of multi-admin features in the matter protocol. And uh, we are actively working on some potential research opportunities such as matter traffic logging and analysis, and on figuring out usability challenges for the matter protocol. Uh, especially on the challenges in device commissioning and discovery. So in conclusion, uh, in the presentation, I introduced a testbed tailored for the exploration and analysis of the matter protocol, and we have a successful usage for the graduate student project to illustrate the usability of the testbed and how we can uh, promote some potential research directions of this matter protocol. Um, thank you, and uh, I'm open for questions. So, uh, very interesting work. So, uh, is your testbed open source? It's not yet. Uh, I'm thinking about doing making that open source because a lot of stuff is kind of, the current source code is combined with another part of the source code that is something we're working on. So, we're thinking about separate the open the testbed part outside. I need to discuss with my colleagues. At the current stage, if you really want to know for now, a uh, easy way is just to just directly send an email to me or the first author here, Ravi, so that I can directly tell you any sources that we have. Sounds good, thank you. So it's very interesting work. Uh, so you mentioned uh, one of the goals of this test, but it's allowed to analyze the traffic between matter devices and the controllers. And so as you know, the traffic is encrypted. Like, could you comment on what you have done in terms of being able to decrypt the traffic? Yeah, so um, regarding the Wi-Fi, um, there are specific uh, APIs that you can set up the key there. And uh, for uh, Wi-Fi devices, they also ha we also have this Python matter, matter server add-on, which can directly give you the traffic information. Regarding the thread, it's a little bit complicated where you need to use a specific uh, uh, tools where you can, again, set up the key there. Um, and I, I can share with you the link if you are interested in that, but there's a detailed guidelines where you can use that tool to set up the master keys used in the thread network so that you can figure out how to decrypt that. But yeah, decryption is a, is a way that you need to go anyway to figure out the network traffic. So one of the uh, essential construct, constructs of matter is uh, devices from different manufacturers being able to talk to each other. So for that, you need certificates and stuff. So how are you establishing that, or are you doing that at all? Uh, regarding the, we are using um, matter devices in the market, so I suppose they are already certified in yeah, their okay. distributed ledger. So uh, if you are thinking about like how to introduce like customized devices into the systems, we do have like a, like a Raspberry Pi where you, or other developing board where you can flash your own customized device type. Uh, if you want to like go through like what the market is doing, then you need to have a way to like kind of put your device type in the distributed ledger, which will be a little bit complicated. So I would say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you you're not on the DCL yet. Yeah, not under DCL. We're just purchasing market devices, but but yeah, we we do have boards to support customized device uh, development, but we are not currently actively using that yet. So we hope that this could be used in the future. I have one more question. So, um, right now, like the lab is physical, all the ma devices, like they are physical matter devices, right? Yeah. But um, I guess, like, if you if you really want to scale it um, and like keep it minimal budget, we would want to see some uh, you know software simulation, software simulated matter devices. 
So do you think like uh, you're looking into that or adding support for that? Uh, we are not currently uh, researching on that, but there, this, this is something we are think we thought about previously, and it's possible. And there are GitHub sources where you can build mm -hmm. Python virtual devices, mm -hmm. uh, which you can flash on Raspberry Pi. So, so for instance, you can flash the source code to mimic a uh, working logic of an uh, of uh, of uh, cluster or something like that, mm -hmm. or all of that. Uh, so it's it's totally possible, and you can. Well, regarding uh, the scalability, I think there is still a number limits in terms of how many virtual devices you can support because of the capability of the Wi-Fi access point. But uh, but still, virtual devices give you ability to include more devices without um, cost too much on buying market devices. Um, one more question. So, like um, in one of your slides, you are mentioning that there are three permission models: admin, uh, user, and the handy tech support. Um, so. I understand like that is when the user wants to interact with the device. Um, however, in matter like one device can talk to another device as well. So uh, what is like the permission model you have set up for that like, which device can talk to which device? Or so this is not part of their student project. The student project is more like, if you want to check a log of certain device attributes, then you go to the system. It's not directly related to how different devices interact with each other. All right, great. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah, if you have more questions, you can still talk to the speaker offline. Uh, our next speaker. Uh, All right, our uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Song Liao from uh, Clementon University. His advisor is uh, Professor Long Cheng, uh, who is also here, who will be our second, second chair of the second session. OK, uh, please start. OK, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Song Liao, and I'm a final year PhD candidate at the Clemson University. Today, I'm glad to share with you our research on the Meta uh, protocol specifically focusing on the hidden hub eavesdropping attack in Meta-enabled smart home uh, systems. The emerging Internet of Things uh, technicals allow users to seamlessly control and interact with their uh, smart home devices. Uh, in 2023, there are already over 16, 000, uh, 16 uh, billion of IoT devices over, wor over the world. Using their mobile apps or the other, uh, uh, other platforms, the e users can easily control their devices, such as the lock, the camera, or their light. However, the IoT devices made by different vendors typically only works in their own ecosystems, compelling users to use their official apps. Such a setting, uh, such a setting greatly impacts the user's experiments. To bridge the gap between the different vendors, the several vendors such as the Amazon, Google, Apple, and the Sam, uh, Samsung uh, provided, introduced and provided the Meta protocol, aiming to enhance the interoperability and the compatibility of the uh, IoT devices. Uh, with the Meta protocol, the users can easily control their devices using different Meta-supported platforms such as Amazon, Google, or, uh, or the Apple. But uh, this table shows uh, the, uh, uh, the Meta-supported devices by the end of 2023, and the Meta has, enabled, uh, has supported the, such as the light, uh, plugs, or the logs, and other devices. Users need to use a Meta controller, also known as a hub, to control their uh, Meta devices. Several uh, companies have updated, uh, updated their exi uh, existing devices, such as Amazon Echo, to uh, perform as a Meta hub to control the user's devices. After using setting up a Meta hub, they, could, they need to connect the Meta hub to their Meta devices. 
the uh, in their apps, they will first ask uh, ask users whether the device supports the Meta, and then users are requested to uh, scan the QR code on the Meta devices. If the uh, if the device is initialized for the first time, the um, uh, the pairing process ends, and the users can control their device. Um, since the Meta protocol is aimed to uh, uh, to bridge the gap between different vendors, so that uh, a d Meta device may be controlled by different uh, different Meta uh, Meta uh, hubs. So for the uh, uh, for the Meta devices that is already connected to a Meta hub, for the second hub they need an additional step to uh, to request the uh, the parent code from the first hub. However, in this process, we discovered some vulnerabilities in the meta pairing process. We, as I mentioned, the second, uh, the second hub need to get the pairing code from the first hub. However, we found that for the second hub, they still, uh, uh, they still have the capability to delegate the device to other hubs, such as some un unauthorized uh, hubs. Uh, also, uh, 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 a meta device can uh, uh, can be connected to multiple meta hubs, and each meta hub could obtain the status of the IoT devices, so that the malicious users can utilize the unauthorized uh, delegation vulnerability, such as an authorized hub, to ever stop the status of other IoT devices. A more serious uh, situation would happen if some sensitive data is is monitored and leaked, such as uh, key, uh, such as a door, uh, the door lock, the status of door locks. We also find that, that there are some flaws in the device management. For example, uh, not in all the uh, although the Meta pro, uh, provides a function for the users to inspect their hubs. However, not every uh, not every vendor inter, uh, provided such a function in their mobile apps. So that the, for the uh, users, they couldn't uh, directly view all the hubs in their mobile apps. The IoT devices also uh, often need to be shared with multiple users, such as in an Air Airbnb room. This figure sh uh, shows the hidden hub ever dropping attack scenario, which includes the two phases, the parent phases and the ever dropping phases. We can imagine that in an Air Airbnb room, the host has installed some Meta devices and also connected these devices to a Meta hub. After the malicious users check in, they can claim that they hope to use their own hub to control all the Meta devices. So the host may provide the, their, uh, the parent code to the malicious users and uh, help them to build the connection. After the host leave, the malicious users can uh, can use their first hub to delegate the devices to their, head, uh, to their second hub, which we named as a hidden hub. So when the uh, malicious users check out, they can hide their hidden hub close to the, uh, close to the Airbnb room and still use the hub to obtain the status update of the IoT devices. Such information could be used to uh, deduce the uh, host's timeline and check whether the host is absent or not. Um, to validate whether the hidden hub ever dropping attack is unrealistic, we also implemented some experiments, and uh, uh, this video shows the, our experiment. Oh, it seems that it couldn't play the sounds, uh, but uh, then it doesn't matter. So when we use the Amazon Alexa, or Google Assistant, or some other uh, meta enabler hubs. Uh, after we invoked some sentences and uh, control the IoT devices, the hidden hub in the right side could also uh, receive the update of all the devices. Based on the uh, vulnerabilities we discovered, we also provide some uh, mitigations and uh, recommendations. First is that we believe the authorization should be obtained from the host instead of the secondary users. 
The second is that we, uh, uh, the vendors should, should provide better device management for the owners so that the owners can easily check their hubs on their mobile apps. In addition, the uh, owner can also check the network traffic to detect any suspicious hub. And uh, at last, uh, the matter could provide a guest mode for the uh, delegated hubs, such as uh, limited, uh, limiting the time uh, limiting the time for the delegated hubs. So this is the end of our uh, presentation, and uh, if you are interested in my, our work, you can visit our website uh, for the video demos. Thank you. Speaker? <laughs> any, any questions? So, um, like in a real world scenario, right? How is the pairing code transferred to the eavesdropper hub? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. So can you go to that eavesdropper hub uh, uh, slide? Uh, like yeah. This page? So here, like, oh, how is pairing code one transferred from the owner's hub to the eavesdropper's hub? Like, uh, so the host will provide the pairing code to the to the uh, to the eavesdropper. Yeah, so, so the assumption here is the the, the owner allow the tenant right, yeah. to have his own hub, yeah. uh, but then tenant further delegate that to a, a hidden hub. That's the idea, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Other, other question? Good presentation. Uh, just another clarification question. So the hidden hub, like, it has to be uh, within the same home network as the owner's hub. Is that right? Uh, uh, not necessarily. So that uh, we can, in fact, uh, in, a, in a such as an RB room, they can put them in the same network. Unless the owner checks the network traffic, they wouldn't find that. So the hidden hub has to be in the same network? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it, it could be. Okay, thank you. All right, other question? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> so then we have the, uh, the last presentation uh, in this uh, session. Uh, Yeah, we ask the tech team please play the uh, third slides. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think yeah, that's right. So the the speaker is the Yi Chen Liu, who is a PhD student at. Uh, Indiana University. Uh, I think you can start. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Chen Liu, and uh, I'm going to represent Hao Chen Wang and other authors uh, to, rep uh, to present our work in progress work, which is called Security Vulnerabilities and Attack Scenarios in Smart Home with Matter. First, I'm going to talk about what is Matter. Matter is a new IoT standard which is designed for smart home ecosystems. Uh, if you have ever paired uh, smart devices such as smart speakers, smart sensor, cameras in your own home, you may find the pairing process very complex. And um, you may download apps from different vendors and you may need hubs that suppose uh, different underlying protocols such as Thread, Z-Wave. With Matter, you only need one app and it supports all of these underlying protocols. It also has some security features such as authentication, authorization, uh, encryption, and, and so on. Next, I'm going to explain some terms that we're going to use. Um, the parent process in matter is called commissioning, and a matter network is called a fabric. Inside a fabric, there can be different kinds of nodes. Um, it can be commissioner, controller, and commissionee. The commissioner can be the app, and the commissionee is the matter of devices from different vendors, and it will have um, similar matter QR code or parent code. 
and the controller as uh, some devices directly interact with the meta devices. And with such a device, you can control your meta devices remotely. And different nodes uh, will have different functions, which is called cluster. For example, a smart bulb can have on-off cluster, reset cluster, and so on. Uh, for the threat model, we consider real-world device sharing scenarios. More specifically, uh, we consider two roles, hosts and guests. We assume an adversary can temporarily access the meta devices and is capable of using apps and development tools such as chip tour to interact with meta devices. Chip tour is a, dev a development tool which is widely used for meta device testing. And we assume the LT system and meta protocol are benign and the adversary cannot airdrop the traffic. Under such scenarios, we identify some weaknesses in matter standard, and we conduct some attack scenarios. The first weakness is um, there's no verification for manufacturing information in matter standard. What is manufacturing uh, manufacturer information? Um, if you're trying to pair the matter device with uh, a vendor's app, uh, you can find such information in um, as the figure shows. And the manufacturer information includes the name of the vendor and a label. In this case, the vendor name is a vendor and the label is test home. And if you're trying to pair your matter device with some vendor's app and chip tour, there will be different ways that you can see in the app to control this device, which we can call them control channels. And here the problem is there is no verification for such manufacturer information, the name and the labels. So we can use chip tour to construct same information. Here we construct four control channels with the same manufacturer information. And uh, more specifically, we can use the commissioner vendor ID parameter and um, the update fabric label command to construct such information. For the second weakness, uh, this is because vendors use matter uh, not so correctly. This is based on some observations. If we're trying to pair our matter device with some vendor, um, and we're trying to pair the meta device with chip tour, we can find some difference. In the app, we can see two control channels, including the app itself and the chip tour. But in chip tour, we can see three control channels. The first one is the app, and the third one is chip tour. What is the second one? We check the vendor ID of this and find it's the app's keychain. And this means if we're trying to pair the um, meta device with the app, it will have two bindings. And the second one is hidden, the kitchen one. This is the first problem. And next, we will conduct an operation to remove the app. As the second picture shows, if we're trying to remove the app, it will just remove the first binding. And the kitchen remains. This is the second problem. And based on this, we can construct attack scenarios. The first scenario is um, we can consider um, in, in a shared home scenario, a, a host invites a guest to his home. And the guest can use chip tour to connect it to the meta devices. But he can um, modify the vendor ID using chip tour. If he can construct uh, the, the same vendor ID with the keychain, in the home side, if he check the app, he can only view his connection. So when the guests leave, the host cannot remove the guests, and the guest can still control the device. 
And this is another scenario. We can consider this time the guest will not use shift work to connect to the matter device. He will you, um, he may want to use his own app to peer to the matter device, maybe for some privacy concern. And this time, the host can see the guest's connection in his app. There can be two control channels. And when the guests leave, the host can remove the guest control. However, because the keychain is still binding, the guests can easily add the device back and without acknowledge the hosts. Finally, I'm going to discuss uh, the root causes of these attacks. Um, the first one is because there's no authentication for when ID fabric labeled such manufacturer informations in matter standard. And the second one is because the kitchen binding is hidden and it will not automatically removed when the host removed the uh, guest fabric. And finally, some comments about the weakness one. We also noticed that some vendors do this in a good manner by indicating that this device is added by another user and we cannot modify the, uh, the fabric labels. Uh, and I think this can be a possible mitigation uh, for the weakness one from the vendor side. Uh, thank you so much. Any, any question from the audience? Yeah, this is really fascinating. I, I do have a question. It's probably more detailed, but uh, I hope we can get some clarification. So as far as I know, uh, every matter device has to present a certificate. Right? It's called device attestation certificate. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that certificate does not include the vendor ID and other fields you mentioned? And that's why you can yeah. fake that w without being discovered? I is that the case? Yes. Uh, that's okay. a very good question. So that's a big loophole. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I can clarify. All right. Since I'm also a co-author of this paper, maybe I can clarify a little bit. Uh, I think uh, I think the, the she uh, in the talk she mentioned that uh, the client, the app, who authenticate to who talk to the device, provide a vendor ID. So that ID is not certified. It's not uh, the certificate in the device that's, that's wrong, that's, uh, that's oh. fake. Yeah. So the app needs to tell the device, okay, I'm Apple app, I'm a Google app, I'm talking with you, yeah. So, so that is basically the controller, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the controller, yeah, yeah. yes. So that's why, that's why I'm confused. So, uh, so that means that under ID consists on the device. Yes. That the device records which are the controllers that are controlling me and who are the vendor of those controllers. Yeah, but that's correct. Um, manufacturers do freeze that on the device. That's clear up. That's yes, that's clean up. Like a, like a factory reset of the device. Then no, yeah. Yes. Any other question? If my understanding is correct, like um, it is node ID which matters between when two devices are communicating. Vendor divide, vendor ID, like um, every uh, every device has a DCL cluster through which it knows who is its controller and who, which devices it can uh, talk to. Um, uh, sorry, ACL cluster, access control list. So um, there only node ID is present for each of the devices, not the vendor ID. So I guess vendor IDs, it is only to, I guess, confuse the consumer who is looking at the phone, not the device. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And the other question? Then I think we can, okay. In terms of the second weakness, uh, how prevalent is uh, this kind of kitchen no band issue? Is that vendor specific or is like um, relate to some protocols statements? The um, second weakness. 
the second weakness right now uh, we find in some vendors. Um, I think it's vendor specific. I see. Thank you. Yes. But overall, the, the intuition, is the, even though matter is uh, supposed to be a standard, but, uh, but uh, the way different vendors integrate matter it seems problematic. That can be, again, heterogeneous if matter standard doesn't uh, provide very deterministic uh, yeah, instructions. Can, can we communicate this to the matter? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we, we, already, we, already, <laughs> we already communicating with the matter. Yes, yes. All right, I think it's time to conclude. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. And we have a coffee break for f half an hour. Then please come back at 3.40. We have another keynote, and followed by the Distinguished Paper Award. Thank you. Hey, I think uh, it's time for us to announce the Distinguished Paper in this uh, workshop this year. So, tech team, can you switch to my presentation to my laptop for a moment? Okay, so yeah, that we give the Distinguished Paper Award to this paper, designing and evaluating a test bed for the meta protocol insights into the user experience. Yeah, for their, for their potential impact and also, also the they really, they really received uh, the highest uh, score. That no tie. They received the highest score in the in the review process. Also considering their potential impact to for education and to promote the research into this area. So we have the award certificate and the author. If you have come, please uh, come to take your award certificate, and we can take a photo together. Professor Long Chen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's start from uh, uh, session two. Yeah. So uh, welcome to session two. So we have basically we have uh, five papers, uh, three in-person presentations, and the rest of two are uh, remote uh, presentations. Okay. So the first uh, speaker, I see you. Um, she's a currently a PhD student at uh, John Hopkins University in uh, Security and Privacy Applied Research Lab. Uh, her uh, primary research interest in the Security and privacy in IoT devices. Uh, her, you know, this is uh, her uh, paper's title: Identifying privacy concerns in smart home environment uh, through behavior mo uh, monitoring. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we all know that IoT devices collect information about us. They collect information about the users that use them. However, we don't know to what extent an adversary can learn about users through their IoT devices. And that's what we attempted to do in our pilot study. So the implications of gaining this unauthorized access is that an adversary is able to better craft their attack so that they're more successful um, at uh, attacking this user. For instance, making the uh, phishing email more appealing to you and uh, aligning it with your interests. So if you've been looking at flights to Miami and hotels in Miami, they're gonna send you an email saying, oh, you could get 50% off, use this link. You're more inclined to click on that link. Another thing is that companies can sell your information for financial benefit, and they're able to customize the user experience based off of your information. And last but not least, in forensic investigations, investigators are able to 
uh, understand the mentality of the victim or the perpetrator based off of what they've been doing in the past week, whether they planned this crime or not. And uh, they can put together a timeline of events. Current literature often focuses on one type of IoT device rather than looking at several devices. And they isolate this device in the lab and they just, they'll use it once or twice throughout the day. When, and this is, um, you know, that's not what IoT devices are meant to do. They're meant to cooperate with other IoT devices. They're meant to be used throughout the day. And that's what we did in our experimentation. We had them, uh, we had different settings that resembled a, realist, a realistic setting. We're using them throughout the day and they're interacting with other IoT devices. Another thing is that oftentimes a threat model is developed to resemble the solution that's being proposed, whereas in our paper we try to reflect on what IoT uh, attacks look like and what these adversaries are capable of and develop a model based off of that. So we, our approach was to identify uh, attacks in literature based off of whether they try to, um, the, the criteria was whether they try to access information and we categorize these attacks based on the type of adversary, the access, whether it's one time or continuous access, the target, whether it's a device or the uh, mobile or companion application, and uh, the data that is, trying, uh, is being accessed. So in summary, this is what we found. A majority of the attacks can be conducted through a uh, remote setting. And as you can see, across all three types of uh, data or proximity levels, only one time access is needed to uh, carry out these attacks, which means that if an adversary is successful once, they're able to gain a lot of information through your data. So to get a, a better understanding, a direct physical access attack is one in which the adversary has to be directly present in front of your, uh, your device. So uh, something like a neighbor that's visiting or a guest that you have in your house, and they're able to, um, let's say, query your smart speaker and say, hey, read me out, uh, read me these emails. They're able to actually, you know, see what you've received in your emails. There's nothing to authenticate whether that's the appropriate user or not. Another thing is looking at the flash memory off of smart TVs and smart speakers. Um, the literature has found that they actually contain recordings in the flash memory. So if you're selling your device to someone else, they're able to access that. For nearby attacks, these are things where you, the adversary is able to connect to the device through the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Um, and these are things such as, you know, someone eavesdropping, listening in on your baby monitor, or even, you know, when you're trying to connect your, uh, your phone to your smart TV, sometimes you can connect to the neighbor's smart TV. And last but not least are remote attacks. And these are, the difference between these types of attacks and nearby attacks is that it, connects directly uh, through wireless access, so it's over the internet through your router. Uh, these are things such as companies uh, gaining access to your data or even your voice recordings for training purposes. Uh, so there was an article that said the um, Amazon employees that had access to uh, your voice recordings for training purposes, uh, one of the employees said that they actually had to go to therapy uh, because of the things that they heard off of these uh, <laughs> Recordings, so you only wonder, you know, what they actually have to listen to. Uh, another thing is uh, traffic monitoring, and you know, if someone's able to guess your password, uh, a username and password. So, looking at the uh, common characteristics shared in each category, we were able to develop th certain threat models based off of these attacks, which can be used in future research. Uh, so, this is based on existing IoT attacks in literature. So the physical uh, threat model would be someone such as your neighbor, a housekeeper, authority, so investigators, uh, or a secondhand owner of a device. Um, and they'll often, the goal is to access your personal device or activity data, and the, uh, the target is the device. Uh, for nearby, it's, you know, anyone that's able to connect using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and they'll often target the device as well. They'll target the personal device and activity data. And for a remote adversary, it's anyone on the internet. And they're uh, oftentimes targeting recordings, personal activity data, and it's usually on the web or mobile applications. As for our findings, we split the findings into two. So direct inferences, something you can d learn directly just by looking at your data, and high-level inferences are things that are implied off of your data. So for direct inferences, these are things such as number of household members and names of the users. 
a lot of these devices keep a record of the devices that are connected to, uh, to, the, to them. So things such as Ethereum's iPhone. Um, and for high level inferences, these are things that if you correlate the data all together, you can gain a better understanding of the user. For instance, relationship. So if there are two users in this household and then based off of their address, you could see that they live in a building, so they're in an apartment. Uh, and if they share the, last, the same last name, they're in a one bedroom apartment, they're most likely to be in a romantic relationship. If they have different last names in a two bedroom apartment, they're most likely to be roommates. So again, these are not, they don't have to be 100% accurate, but it increases your confidence in the assumptions you make as an adversary. And they, be, they help you uh, better customize your attacks to be more successful. Another thing is that a lot of the information or the data reflects the primary user. And this is often, this is the user that interacts with the devices mainly um, and configures these devices. So it'll be, they'll use their, their emails, their phone numbers, and it's easier to infer more information about them than secondary users. Uh, any devices that are able to connect to your email or read your emails or access any recordings, oftentimes that's the treasure trove to adversaries. So they're able to learn a lot uh, about these users because um, you, know, you get sensitive things in your email. So you get financial information, reminders to pay off your, your debt or your loan, um, things about submitting assignments if you're a student, and as for recordings, there's a lot going on in the background. So not only are you querying your smart speaker, but there's also stuff going on in the background. Again, referring to that um, article about the Amazon employee hearing too much and having to go to therapy. And last but not least, a lot of the uh, data can be inferred or the access or the, uh, the IoT attacks are made possible due to vulnerabilities in co companion applications. So the mobile applications, the web applications, oftentimes there's not a lot of um, access control put in place where you're able to create different users with different roles, allowing different users to use your devices. So if you have a guest over and they want to use your smart speaker, they can use it easily without the uh, commands being authenticated. So one example to bypass this or mitigate it is, if I ask to read my emails, maybe ask me for a password and I can vocally give you that password, maybe send me a one-time uh, code to my phone, and then when I authorize it, read me the emails. Another thing is that if you're, you, know, you have a house sitter, you want them to use your uh, Nest thermostat, uh, allow me to create a role where they have access to certain features and not able to access other things. And if you'd like more details, I'm happy to discuss later after this, or you can refer to the paper. And thank you all. So have you considered, so in your model, it's a smart home, mm -hmm. but you know there are lots of homes which are complex homes, meaning yes. that there are multi-tenants in the same building that share facilities, that may share networks and so on. Have you, is that part of your research? So the, the settings that we have are, are not multi-tenant, they're more, well, I, I understand what you mean. You mean more in the building setting, more than one home within this building and oh, if they can access, yeah, exactly. So no, we did not, this is a pilot study and we hope to extend it to include that. But the primary um, focus of our research grant is multi-tenant settings. So this is just an initial step and then hopefully we'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, if no other question, I think uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Karan is working as a postdoc at Siemens. Uh, he was a postdoc at Uppsala University, and uh, he developed the solutions for uh, layer two uh, to seven security issues uh, in, in body networks. So today he will share uh, his solution how to about uh, securing the I mean improve the security of the application layer communication protocol called a, how to pronounce that the OS core, OS core. OS core. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Let's welcome the speaker. Yeah. Remote control for the presentation? Yeah, I think. Okay. 
So um, the workshop description, the workshop description already mentions the constraint application protocol, COAP for short. And uh, this uh, protocol is basically a lightweight version of the HTTP protocol for the Internet of Things. And what it makes uh, this protocol lightweight is that you can run it on top of UDP. And this eliminates all the connection establishment termination business, so it uh, eliminates lots of messages. And now the OSCOP protocol is an application layer security solution, particularly, particularly for co-app. Conceptually, it sits in between your application and the co-app implementation. So when you send a message, that could be a request or a response, the OSCOR um, yeah, layer uh, encrypts and authenticates this message and um, creates a new protected co-app message, which is then uh, sent to the other end. And the at the receiver side, the message gets decrypted, the authenticity is checked, and the uh, yeah, duplicates are eliminated. And then the original message is sent, uh, yeah, passed to the application layer of the receiver side. And um, now I'm coming back. Yeah, apart from OSCOR, there are also other ways to secure the application layer, namely, for example, IPsec and DTLS. And what all these uh, security solutions give you is authenticated encryption and uh, counter-based replay protection. On top of that, OSCOR, um, yeah, since it uh, works at the application layer, it gives you true end-to-end -end security, which is really nice because you don't have to trust any middle box in between. And it also um, yeah, has an built-in defense against so-called mismatch attacks. In such attacks, uh, um, an attacker injects a response that originally was sent in reply to another request. And in our paper, we introduced another ver a new version of OSCOR called OSCOR NG, Next Generation, which eliminates some remaining um, vulnerabilities of the OSCOR protocol, namely um, a vulnerability to delay attacks and to denial of sleep attacks. In this presentation, I will only go into these delay, delay attacks uh, in more detail. And um, the idea is, since we use, uh, OSCOR uses a counter-based replay protection, you can basically delay such messages uh, uh, as long as you want. Um, as long as it's, uh, this message looks fresh for the receiver side, it will get accepted. This can, come, for example, get problematic when you're interacting with a door lock. So imagine you have a, an open command, then it gets delayed by some malicious forwarder, for example, and then at a later point in time, the message gets re-injected by the attacker and opens the door. And um, yeah, the uh, IETF actually standardized uh, a mitigation which uh, yeah, implements an echo-based replay protection. In that case, the smart lock um, yeah, first generates an, uh, a challenge um, which has to be um, replied by the original sender. So it, uh, int, uh, yeah, it introduces an additional round trip. But this one has uh, yeah, some obvious uh, drawbacks. So you have the communication overhead, and on top of that, you have to account for um, um, necessary retransmissions. So there's a long time span where you have to accept this, uh, uh, yeah, challenge, uh, which is when you when we assume default values of the CoA protocol, 51 seconds, so almost a minute. And this uh, this IATF standard also does not add protection for responses, so responses are still vulnerable to delay attacks. And we overcome all these uh, problems. And um, yeah, we um, basically replace counters with timestamps. And we um, particularly, we use the uptime timestamps. And we um, this, uh, yeah, uh, separate one cost grained information, the so-called time slot which is uh, in our implementation ten, about 10 seconds, and the uh, fine-grained information, which we call phase. So phase is the, be the time since the beginning of the current time slot. And both the time slot and the phase become part of the nonce that we pass to the authenticated encryption algorithm instead of the counter that was originally used. But uh, usually, 
we only transmit uh, the phase information, so the fine-grained time information, along with the OSCO, mes OSCO NG messages. And uh, the time slot information has to be res restored by the receivers. It's not explicitly communicated. And way, the way this is done is that we um, initially run a, a time synchronization protocol where we learn and just the, different, uh, um, the difference between the uptime of the resender and the receiver side um, yeah, using a short handshake. And for this protocol, we did not invent by, by ourselves, but we adopted a proven one from the literature called the Secure Pairwise Synchronization Protocol. So we just uh, yeah, uh, uh, stand back and forth a couple of timestamps. And um, then the crucial part is that this protocol also checks whether, the, uh, uh, whether there are only uh, whether there are already delay attacks going on here, and this ensures that we get a bound on the offset on the on our estimation of the timestamp. And when we go back to this delay attacks, so the um, the re correct restoration of the time slot information only works for a bounded period of time, and then. Uh, yeah, when we at, at a higher threshold, the restoration of the time slot information will no longer work. So when we when a delay uh, when an attacker, for example, delays this unlock command for uh, eight seconds in our implementation, then the restoration of the nonce will no longer work, and so the message will look inauthentic to the receiver. And in this manner, we uh, yeah, then can prevent or sort out these delayed uh, messages. And the funny thing is uh, that we uh, achieve a lower communication overhead even if we compare to the original counter-based uh, uh, replay protection, which has no defense against delay attacks. And that's because we only send uh, this uh, very small phase information, which is just three bits, uh, along with every uh, OSCO NG message. And this uh, time synchronization also introduces only a, short, uh, a small overhead because it has to be done only once uh, at the beginning and then at a very low uh, interval of six hours. So we don't have to send any extra messages. We can just send our timestamps uh, on top, uh, send along with the messages that are being sent anyway. So to conclude, we uh, prevent these delay attacks while also reducing the communication overhead. And um, yeah, I had no time to go into this denial of sleep attacks, but these make uh, OSCOR send additional messages, which uh, yeah, consumes the uh, precious uh, energy that we have on energy constrained IoT devices. And this uh, vulnerability is also fixed in the paper. And an Im interesting implication is that uh, if we we'll manage to lower the delays, uh, yeah, the bounds that we can establish for the security get better. And we also, also at the same time reduce um, the time that we need to cache messages to, in order to prevent replay attacks. So any improvement in, uh, in delays helps in security and also in reducing, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in reducing memory consumption. And that's why we want to focus on our future work on reducing um, yeah, the, uh, co uh, the exponential backoffs, which are typically happen at the Mac layer uh, when there's a lot of contention going on because they introduce uh, yeah, the most delays in our stack. All right, uh, yeah, very interesting topic. So uh, let's thank the speaker and uh, so by the way, uh, any questions? So there is an assumption that you have a time server, right? An NTP time server. How do the how does the synchronization work without the time server? Um, there's no time server. We um, so the timestamps are the uptime of the IoT rise since booting. So this is a, uh, this is just the raw timestamp that you get without any synchronization. So each each endpoint maintains its own. Each uh, each uh, yeah. The, uh, here here's the time when we start uh, booting. 
that the first time slot and we just uh, let the time run. There are no uh, jumps in the time. We just learn then using this protocol um, the relative difference between the sender and the receiver side and this happens between each pair of communicating nodes. So we are not uh, vulnerable to any, um, yeah, that's probably also important to mention. Uh, usually when you use such kind of replay protection with wall clock timestamps, um, you have the problem that you are dependent on the security of the time synchronization protocol. But this is not the case here. We use this uh, secure pairwise synchronization protocol and just compute these, uh, yeah, relative differences between the uptime of the communicating endpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And I have a quick question. So uh, I'm curious about, uh, you know, what kind of uh, IoT products are currently using OSCOR, uh communication protocol? Uh, I couldn't, can't name any particular uh, products, but uh, the IATF is strongly promoting it for any of their co-op protocols, so mm -hmm. for device management and so on. They are building uh, co-op-based protocols and their recommendation is always OSCO, So. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. So, uh, yeah, our third paper presenter, please. Okay, so our third paper, um, the authors are from the uh, University of uh, Maryland, College Park. Uh, Austin is currently a graduate p uh, student at the University of Maryland. His research is focused on hardware security and particularly in satellite uh, attacks. So today he will talk about his research on satellite uh, attacks. Hello everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about specifically attacking homogeneous averaging processes via side channel attack. Now, that's all words, what I mean by that. Before we go on to that, let's just, uh, let me explain what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna talk to you about the background and some motivation. I'll tell you what the experiment was. I'll get in some results and I'll talk about some future work that we've begun and will potentially do in the future. So before we go ahead, two incredibly important terms that most of you know, but just in case. Uh, an electromagnetic side channel attack. Now, a side channel attack is a type of security attack that in involves exploiting emissions. Uh, well, an electron electromagnetic side channel attack is a type of security attack that involves uh, exploiting el electromagnetic emissions from electronic systems to gain information about their operation or data being processed within, within these systems. You need to be in somewhat close proximity to be able to uh, pull off this attack. So this is a physical attack, not a remote attack. Now, federated learning and the averaging process within this. Uh, as you heard in previous talks, data hoarding is now becoming a thing. So companies are now looking to federated learning, which is a process that involves not sharing data, but sharing models to be able to collaborate and create better um, ML, uh, ML algorithms together. So, and the averaging is a step in federated learning where a centralized server is used to collect the weights of individual users after they're trained locally, and the collected values are averaged on this centralized server. So the motivation behind this is in recent years, a new metric called SAVAT was developed and piqued my interest. This me metric makes it possible to quantify the differences in code execution down to the level of which assembly code instruction was executed in which order simply by using electromagnetic side channel attacks. So this idea spark, uh, sparked another idea within me. Would it be possible to go a step further and determine the values of the floating point numbers used in these instructions? So I conducted an experiment. I took a Beagle Bone Black, which is just like a Raspberry Pi, a board, uh, a magnetic loop, just a $20 magnetic loop you can buy on Amazon, a do-it-yourself kit, a spectrum analyzer provided to me by the university, and my personal computer. I took this board and I used it to run code for which the attacker would try and find the values. It's running a federated, lear federated learning averaging process on 15 million randomly generated values. The magnetic loop is used to capture these values and pull off the electromagnetic side channel attack. And this data, is gathered and then emitted to, and then transferred to the spectrum analyzer. And you can see a bit of it on screen and I'll show you another photo later on, but that data that you see on screen, those yellow spikes 
are displayed in, in a specific matter, which are then saved on, on, on a PC in the form of a CSV file, which I can then analyze. So details on the data. A typical way, uh, a typical snapshot of one data sample is as you see on screen. Uh, I made sure that the averaging loop running the, the, the federated learning process would have uh, homogeneous values, so to put it simply, they would be in powers of 10, so 0 to 9.9, 10.0 to 99.9, so on and so forth. Uh, this allow allowed me to directly compare the side channel response of one homogeneous group of values, for example, 10 to the power 10, versus another, versus another like 10 to the power 4, to see if the response had changed. Uh, and this is, I, I believe, a, val a snapshot of 10 to the power 10 on the side. And this image is then converted into a 1 by 45 array corresponding to the values that you see on screen, saved in a CSV file. So, uh, we had hypothesized that as the homogeneous groups grew, the uh, average of the responses we would get would be higher, which was not the case, as you can see, in the blue graph to the side. But we realized that the standard deviation of this crew and the mode of this crew with the homogeneous group size, which meant that uh, we, were be, we were able to determine and classify these values properly. Now, once we did this, we decided to automate this process because to be frank, uh, this takes a while. Uh, so we decided why not use machine learning to automate this classification process. Uh, we train multiple algorithms, um, just, um, and the CNN was the best algorithm that we used out of these multiple algorithms, and it was able to determine up to 93% accuracy to which group um, uh, the, the federated averaging process just ran, for example, 10 to the 4 versus 10 to the 0. Uh, but it's important to note that it did struggle for groups in, groups in similar proximity, for example, 10 to the 0 and 10 to the 1, which we'll be working on to get better results. Uh, so, most importantly, future work. We believe that federated learning is extremely important to the future of IoT and many other um, uh, places as well, which is why we are trying to improve the equipment we have. Like I said in the beginning, we only had a DIY uh, sample kit and the spectrum analyzer we used was very old, it was from the 1980s, and I had to trick my computer, I had to trick it to think my computer was a floppy disk for it to save stuff on there. So the read and write was terrible, which meant that we couldn't work with heterogeneous groups. A real life federated learning process is a heterogeneous group, and we were only able to artificially simulate that by, uh, by mix and matching these homogeneous groups that we took. So, so by simply uh, uh, getting better equipment, and potentially bettering the, um, uh, the machine learning process that we created, we will hopefully be able to fully attack a federated learning process and break it, as I say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Yeah, I have a question, uh, you know, about the EM uh, attack. So have yes. you uh, tested the attack range for your case? You know, how far the attack can be launched? So the DIY kit can't be too far. It's up to 30 centimeters, but there's stuff online that you're willing to buy. If you're willing to buy it, that can be up to, I believe, 25 meters. So as long as you're within the same building, mm -hmm. if you're just walking by, you can get that data. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you don't need to directly attach it to a spectrum analyzer. Even if you do want to, there's many analyzers available online right. that you can put in your pocket. So collecting data is not an issue when it comes to uh, physical distance, as long as it's not like mm. like one building away, if that makes yeah. sense. And uh, you know, another question is about the mitigation. You know, so it's not a specific to your uh, you know, side channel attack, it's a general you know, yes. against the EM side channel. So what, what do you think, like uh, the mitigations, like uh, inject some noise, you know, EM noises, sign signals, or some other mitigation, or some physical, like, uh, 
you know, to block the EM signal. Right, you yeah. would need to, the, the key issue here is that noise itself is not enough because we injected noise and it <laughs> still worked, it's in the paper, <laughs> but um, the current process of this, the centralized averaging process is too basic and too straightforward, which makes this attack possible even with the noise. So mm -hmm. the averaging process itself needs to be revamped or improved upon for this attack to fail, which is mm -hmm. why we believe it's important to bring this to attention earlier. So, you know, five years down the line when, the, when federated learning is so in such common use that we don't have our data leaking to malicious hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Okay. So thanks to the speaker again. Yeah. So um, yeah. So next, so uh, our uh, the fourth paper will be uh, online. So uh, okay. Okay. So. So, hello everyone, can you hear me? All righty. Yes, yeah. I can hear you, but yeah. I have to share my screen and let me... Sorry, I could, I cannot share my screen. So you're on mute. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me virtually today. Uh, my name is Hamid Haddad Baju. I'm a senior researcher at the University of Guelph at Cyber Science Lab. And today I'm going to give a presentation on our recent research on uh, adversarial machine learning, uh, malware threat detection, and a uh, code cave approach. So um, malware threats had been a formidable challenge across diverse IT infrastructure nowadays. And malicious actors are aware of this structural sketch and they tend to create and generate a malicious payload for uh, injecting to the in infrastructure and attacking the infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure, sorry. So adversary attack pose a significant challenge to detect uh, action of the model, uh, like the MathCon. And our study goes to address this challenge through the uh, code cave approach. So current um, malware detection models are vulnerable to adversarial machine learning, like the other type of deep neural network uh, model, like image based or textual based. But uh, recent um, malware threat detection model like MathCall are also vulnerable to the adversarial attack. And these kind of attacks uh, try to crafting the uh, executable file to pass or bypass or evade the uh, detection system or mechanism. And we are going to uh, show that uh, there is another approach with a minimal uh, modification of executable file to bypass those 
detection mechanism and which is uh, especially in cloud edge uh, devices uh, which uh, are limited in computational uh, resources. Here our representation of our proposed methodology. So uh, we are work on byte code level of uh, any executable file. We are calling about IoT uh, executable file, and we have uh, executable segmentation like text, data, and read-only data. And we have a variety analyzer, which is try to find the code cave, and we use a generator and try to bypass a discriminator, which is the MathCon for our uh, payload generation and we apply the FGSM fast gradient assign method for generating the adversarial example. So the main uh, concept is try to found the code caves which are the spare byte uh, so spare bar, spare byte codes inside the executive file. If I want to give a, a detailed ex uh, explanation regarding the code caves the code caves are spare byte code inside the executable file but we exercise just data segment of executable file because the data segment uh, loaded on memory and it could be modified uh, during the runtime using the mnd so uh, last but not least if i want to conclude our uh, experiment and our research our approach uh, needs minim minimalistic modification in compare to the traditional model that need additional bytecode or thousands of bytecode modification to bypass or evade the uh, detection mechanism and, or detection model. And also we got higher evasion rate than the uh, other um, model or previous model with minimal uh, uh, modification and also we uh, have a new approach for uh, making a detection model, uh, malware detection model of IoT environment more robust. And um, we hope uh, to uh, have to extend the experiments and we could detect the adversarial example which uh, utilizing the code cap based on uh, their feature density like the MMD feature analysis and extract the pattern from the feature uh, densities. Thank you so much for your attention and your our references and I'm happy to answer all your questions. Right, so thanks the speaker. Uh... Any question? I have a question about, uh, so you know, uh, so, Hamada, can you hear us? Can you hear us? <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But in terms of time, so, you know, because um, uh, we are, you know, running out of time, so maybe we just skip the question and answer. Let's move to the next uh, uh, paper, our last paper. Okay. Hamad, bye. <laughs> I can't hear you, sorry. I cannot hear us. <laughs> Expertise in uh, embedded systems, uh, sensor hacking, uh, robotics, like kind of machine learning, um, and ad level intelligence. So he has a successful uh, track record on, of uh, organizing and standing uh, events, having run an standing events organization for more than 10 years and organized over 200 education events worldwide. Very impressive. Additionally, he has industrial experience as a technical director uh, in a company in, in India for over 10 years and has been recognized that for his academic achievement with a, a golden a gold uh, medal in uh, embedded system. So let's welcome the speaker. Is the speaker uh, on Zoom? Oh, sounds good.
Hello everyone. Uh, sorry, I cannot listen to you. Uh, can you unmute, please? Okay, let's share my screen. Yes, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, sharing is actually not working. Yes, I can share now. Hello everyone, I'm Roshan Kumar Singh and I'm from IIT Roopad, India. Thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, my topic is about TinyML meets IOBT against sensor hacking. And this is the combined work of my uh, guide, Dr. Surupta Mishra and myself, Roshan Kumar Singh. So the motivation uh, and problem statement, what we are going to have here is like at present, you can see that Internet of Battlefield thing is uh, an Internet of Battlefield is very much popular because it provides the additional capabilities to the borders and uh, the border security forces. So it's very useful because it's already connected the sensors and uh, the Internet are doing a remarkable job in that field. So at present, even you can take the case of India, we have 15,000 kilometer of uh, land borders uh, combined from connected from different countries and only uh, 15,000 kilometers we cannot be staying there to uh, see all the security threats so for that purpose we have this type of uh, wire fences this type of metal fences are there to protect but these are very uh, vulnerable anybody can cut and enter in any country so so you can see that uh, right now we are dealing with sensor hacking and tiny ML. So what is sensor hacking? Sensor hacking is a type of ch side channel attack like our friends in previous paper talked about electromagnetic interferences. So that is also a type of sensor hacking. So we hack and we confuse the sensors, but their readings are confused. So once the reading of the sensors are confused, all additionals and higher layer gets the wrong reading. And because of the wrong reading, the whole uh, data interpretation, prediction and control gets confused. Then, so what is the solution we are providing? We are providing the solution and that is called as tiny machine learning. We provide the intelligence and capabilities and the, uh, the higher level of uh, cognition to the microcontroller itself, the resource constrained device that was considered dumb before that is now very much intelligent. So that is our work. So what is the problem statement? Problem statement is we want to identify that in the case of unauthorized entry on the borders, what possible solutions can be there and if it is attacked by uh, a different type of sensor hacking systems so which is uh, going to give the appropriate and accurate results so before entering to the solutions so we want to see that background of the work done so far from the border securities field so you can see that starting from uh, this human monitoring system wire fencing till hardware level intelligence there ha there is a long way to go and they have already gone from 1990s. It was started long back. So from 1990s to 2021, there has been many extensive work in the domain. But in the case of sensor hacking, attacking these sensors, there are no work so far. So what is our proposed solution to solve these type of issues? So first, we can give the conventional systems. Like we want to make or the use of a basic microcontroller that is Arduino Nano. And we want to connect with IMU sensor. Uh, this one is, uh, we are using MPU 6050. So that will give you the orientation of X, Y, and Z. So what we are basically telling that this system, just a basic microcontroller connected with MPU 6050 can identify that there is some intrusion attack. I mean, they are trying to enter in the network, enter in the territory of any other country. So for that, generally what the people do, they cut the wire or they lift the wire and they enter in other countries or territory. So in that case, what happened is, uh, we want to uh, we want to train the microcontroller in such a way uh, so that if the wire is lifted or the wire is cut in that when the orientation will change in that case uh, it will give the alert to the people that okay somebody is trying to enter in the country then what is the uh, how we are going to attack it so this one is our handmade uh, attack device electromagnetic device we have created so this gives a very powerful electronic uh, surge to the uh, microcontrollers which is available in front of that and additional charges introduced on the metallic part of the microcontroller confuses the sensor. And because of that, a different type of reading is generated that is actually not possible from this type of sensor. So you can see before attack scenario, you can see 
before a tax scenario, there was the value of X was uh, 1.14 in the case of second 1.12 and like that. So, and that got this much variation up to minus 84.5185. So it is this type of variation is like 75 times, 385 times. So this looks totally unpredictable and this type of reading is con considered that no, that is sensor got confused. And because of that, people won't consider that one. So this is the variation in the attack you can see. So that is happening here. Now, another thing you can see that this is the variation in the value of X, Y, and Z. So when the X, Y, and Z values are getting changed, so that is uh, this many variations are there. And this is number of times the variation happened in the sensor readings. So now our second solution we are giving, this is the actual solution. So we are going to train the microcontroller with machine learning capabilities. So this time we are going to take Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense module that is a ML powered microcontroller. So in this microcontroller, we are going to train it for the two scenarios. One is victim and one is attack scenarios. So victim unit is victim unit and attack unit are two modules, which is like uh, one is microcontroller as is having the inbuilt uh, micro sensor. So that sensor is trained with the microcontrollers uh, different different readings. So you can see that victim and attack scenarios are so in this microcontroller itself is having the IMU sensor and that we are going to train for different different data points. So if the wire is lifted, I mean the fence is lifted or the fence is cut for those conditions uh, that is trained. So this compared to the previous one, this has uh, multiple data points. Previous one was having only if -il statement, but this is having multiple data points. So if it matches at least to one point that is considered as some attack is happening. So our main objective is to identify the solution of this type of attack and stress test this type of microcontroller against electromagnetic interference attacks. So we are finding that what will be our future solutions? What is the best microcontroller or what I, and uh, what all other machine learning models can be used to uh, mitigate these type of EMP attacks? So our experimental setup uh, have uh, this workspace organization and other uh, setups that we are going to see practically. So you can see to imitate the actual uh, border security areas. So we have, uh, we have created this type of setup. And we have uh, set this microcontroller systems for training and testing purpose on the same uh, type of fence. So when the wire, when the fence moves or when the fence is cut, in all the conditions, it can identify the distinguish it, uh, it can differentiate basically. So we have taken uh, the sample of 21 minutes and 20 seconds. So we have taken samples uh, in the West less number because microcontroller is a resource constraint, constraint device. And apart from identification of this type of attack, it also has to do communication and encryption parts. So because of that, the model should not be that big so that it will confuse the microcontroller itself. So even with this number of samples, we are getting 95.4% of accuracy. And you can see the final results. So you can see that this is the condition when the attack is being happened. Right now we are giving the attack and at the same time we are trying to find the result also. You can see there is no variation in detection. Anomaly is identified as wind or intrusion. Wind considering that there is no attack, that is a normal wind movement of the fence. And anomaly is Another condition when there is intrusion is the condition when somebody is attacking this one. You can see that the attacking uh, this one is detect, uh, detected correctly with a 98.6% accuracy and the wind is detected with accuracy of 100%. So our final conclusion is, so in the conventional system when microcontroller and the sensor is uh, separately used, in that case 446 times of variation is detected. But in the case of tiny ML system, our model is 95.4% accurate during that training time and deployment accuracy of 99.29% we have uh, achieved. Peak RAM uses 1.7 KB and other specifications are below. So our final verdict is tiny ML powered microcontrollers are far superior than conventional sensor microcontroller systems. And significance and future enhancement is tiny ML can be uh, explored more for uh, future uh, devices where security is the main forte. So thank you very much. Um, I'm open to the questions. Conclude today's uh, workshop and uh, thanks for you know coming attending today's workshop. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. It's good to see you next year. Yeah, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and the conference.